Hi everyone, welcome to Man with Demon. Please don't forget to subscribe, enjoy the video. King Bina's rose stands with an air of authority. His voice echoes to the grand halls of the palace as he says, I, King Bina's Roche of the Durand Kingdom, solemnly decree the dissolution of our marriage. Our Noah Salyo occasion, you are hereby stripped of your title as Queen of Duran. As your presence is no longer welcome in this kingdom, you must now return to your home in the capital of the empire. As a last act of kindness, I intend to provide you with an old carriage for the journey. If you beg him in earnest, perhaps his imperial majesty will allow you to remain within his palace. Blood is thicker than water, after all. He may be willing to put past differences aside and take you back in. His decision to dissolve the marriage is fueled by a mix of frustration and newfound liberation. I know a sailored Cajun, the once queen, receives the news with a mix of shock and defiance. Her noble lineage and pride are wounded. Larissa Sti, a lady-in-waiting with a hidden agenda, revels in the unfolding drama, her loyalty shifting towards the ambitious pursuit of becoming the new queen. Larissa Estia is asking the king, Oh my, does she really intend to travel all the way to the capital in a tiny little carriage? I'm nauseated just thinking about it. Larissa is the daughter of a wealthy Duranian noble and Queen Arnaud's lady-in-waiting. She is allowed the luxury of living in the royal palace as a lady-in-waiting and is widely known as King Benus's other woman. The king looks at Larissa with affection and calls her name. Larissa, Larissa replies. I understand this is no light-hearted occasion, but I wanted to offer you my support. Nevertheless, as a sign of his everlasting affection, King Binas presented Lady Larissa with a special gift, a finely wrought silver tiara. Its centerpiece of black diamond is more brilliant than starlight and of a hue deeper than the mysterious depths of the sea. This gem was part of a pair, and the other diamond was embedded into King Benaz's crown. Both diamonds had come into King Benaz's possession as part of Anoa's dowry. Not a soul in the empire could have foreseen this divorce. It seemed unfathomable that Anoa's sailored Cajun, sole imperial princess and bearer of the empire's most illustrious lineage, would be subjected to such a humiliating divorce. Such a pity to think they'd end up divorced. Larissa, does she not hail from far nobler ancestry compared to the king? The king says in a grease of what that's that. She wasn't even worth my time. I should have divorced her sooner. There were different voices chattering in the palace as people whispered in each other's ear. But with her head hanging in shame before his majesty, she appears the same as any other divorcee. This divorce is an embarrassment to the imperial family. Even if she is allowed to return... I'm sure she'll spend the rest of her days locked away in a tower. It would be more fitting to call Lady Larissa our queen. Upon hearing these voices, the princess looks sad, whereas, on the other hand, Larissa is looking happy. It was no secret that King Benaz did not love his queen, but the prevailing expectation was that divorce would be avoided for the benefit of his kingdom. This was a reasonable conclusion given that Queen Anoa was Emperor Luciano's half-sister, and niece of Duke Rickle, who had made a name for himself as a tyrant in the southern regions of the empire. Claiming a woman of such noble pedigree, as his queen gave King Binas a sense of superiority he had not been privileged to feel before as a ruler of a tiny sovereign state. That gave him reason to maintain this loveless marriage for two years, but eventually, his heart turned entirely in favor of his mistress Larissa. As Larissa was no longer satisfied playing the role of his mistress, King Benaz decided to crown her as his new queen. Of course, it was not an easy decision. Several factors contributed to why their marriage of two years ended in divorce. The first was that he had reason to believe Larissa was pregnant. The second was the queen's sudden change in conduct, which proved to be quite wicked indeed. And the third and final reason which led King Binus to move forward with proceedings for the divorce was his certainty that the dissolution of their marriage would still leave him in good standing with the emperor. He was assured of this by the emperor's messenger who came to him in the middle of the night, a sorcerer who possessed the cold beauty of a statue. The emperor's messenger came to meet the king and gave him the message of emperor. The emperor will not oppose the divorce between the king and queen of Duran. 
The esteem in which this kingdom holds the empire has already been demonstrated by your behavior in the past. King thoughts that he's her Tio discuss the terms of the divorce. Emperor's messenger reveals more information as the dowry offered by the imperial princess is but a trifle compared to the riches stored in the imperial treasury. It would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations between our two kingdoms over such a trivial matter. The king is shocked, and he in a state of happiness. Does the messenger mean to say I can end it? The emperor will not demand back on Noah's dowry even after the divorce? I can part ways with that woman without suffering any consequences at all. King Benes, cold and resolute, dismisses the value of his former queen with a mix of disdain and arrogance. His decision to divorce is not only a personal matter but a strategic move to secure favor with the powerful Emperor Luciano. King to Princess, standing in the palace, it's time to say farewell. I didn't intend for us to end this way from the start. Perhaps this could have been avoided if you had behaved with a little more rest. If I had known, I might have been able to subdue that damn pride of hers. Just if she had clung to him, begging for his love the night of the wedding and desiring to snub the hottie. Princess Bina sought Larissa's chambers. But if our Noah had humbled herself and waited for him, playing the coquette like Larissa always did, the king continued his dialogue then perhaps I might have given this marriage a chance. Night after night, Binas abandoned his lawful wife for the embrace of his mistress, but Anoa made no attempt to stop him, not even once. The king whispered in the ear of Larissa, who was standing beside him, about the princess that I'm certain she thought I was beneath her, being a ruler of such a small and powerless kingdom. I see you remain insolent to the very end. I wish never to lay eyes on you again. Go back to where you belong and leave us in peace. Saying this, he throws the divorce on princess. The emotions intensify as the divorce document is thrown onto the princess. Anoa, once proud and regal, now stands broken and betrayed. King Benes, however, remains stoic, convinced of the righteousness of his actions. The twist in the tale comes as Princess Anoa, instead of crumbling in despair, surprises everyone with a composed reaction. Her apparent joy and gratitude for the dissolution of the marriage leave the court in shock, questioning her sanity. Princess, addresses the king. So the deed is done. We are divorced. I suppose there is no need to keep up false pretenses any longer. King, shocking said. Huh? What? Princess lifts her head and said. Since you are not my husband anymore. The king furiously said. What is the meaning of this? Princess calmly replied to the king. We are officially divorced, are we not, king? I see the news must have been quite a shock, for it seems you have lost both your mind and manners. I know not what you mean. I've suffered enough for the past two years, and I couldn't be more grateful to you for ending our marriage. People in the palace whispering. Does she fail to grasp what's happened to her? Princess, I've endured you in your court for as long as I could, and you've given me precisely what I wanted. Allow me to thank you for saving me. The king, how dare you speak to me in that manner? Princess, unfortunately it appears you are the one who fails to grasp what is happening. Benes, king looks very angry, as he says. I've never seen her smile like that during our entire marriage. It seems the shock of the divorce has gotten to your head. But may I remind you? Princess made an announcement which left everyone in shock. Bell, come out and deliver the Emperor's message to the King of Duran. The palace whispers in confusion as I know its true intentions come to light. I ask, is she insane? There is just no other excuse for her behavior. What in the world is she talking about? The introduction of Bell, the enigmatic sorcerer, adds an extra layer of mystery to the unfolding drama with skin as white as snow and hair as dark as night, with silver-gray eyes that seemed to penetrate the gaze of any onlooker and a face so beautiful it appeared to be chiseled by the gods. It was the very same sorcerer who Binus spoke to the previous night. King Binus was taken aback at the sight of the boy. Upon seeing him, he exclaimed, What is the emperor's messenger doing here? The young messenger, clad in white and black shoes, calmly responded, I came because I was called, swirling in his light brown royal dress. 
he continued. Although I feel more like an errand boy than a messenger, did you not hear the new empress call for me? Larissa, visibly stunned, questioned the new empress. Binas, growing irritated, added, I don't know what you mean. Meanwhile, Anoa, holding a divorce letter, grinning continuously standing beside him. He revealed, Luciano occasion is dead. The imperial messenger, I am here to announce his passing. Binas, in utter shock, exclaimed, The emperor is dead in anger. He shouted, Nonsense! His imperial majesty is in fine health, the undisputed tyrant and ruler of the empire. The young emperor Luciano Cajun had no heirs. Binas inquired, If what you say is indeed true, then Prince Arian must now be seated on the imperial throne? The messenger replied, No, Prince Arian is also dead. Adding, They were both assassinated. Servants were shocked, and whispers filled the air. Binas loudly exclaimed, What foolishness is this? How dare you spout such lies about his imperial majesty? I know, insisted the news of his passing is no lie. The message comes from the imperial messenger himself, so it cannot be a falsehood. Binas deep in thought pondered. That's impossible, but what will happen if this news is really true? He added, no one could have foreseen such a sudden turn of events. Emperor Luciano was not involved in any known disputes, and he was in excellent health. Furthermore, only a few years had passed since his coronation. He recalled the moment when he, wearing his coat, addressed the servant, saying, I find there is an excessive amount of appointments as of late. The servant bowed and replied, I shall see if any items can be rearranged on the itinerary, your majesty. He ordered, We'll discuss this further upon my return. The servant replied, Yes, your majesty, I shall be waiting patiently. In his thoughts, he pondered, making the news of his assassination all the more unexpected. He inquired, Then who will inherit? The boy replied, As the emperor had no heirs, the crown will be passed down to whoever is next in line. He explained, According to your nuptial agreement, the husband would have been designated as the successor of any inheritance that was passed down to his wife, not just wealth. Meanwhile, Arona stood twisting her arms and smiling. He added, But any title as well. In other words, you would have been the successor of the imperial throne, Binas. Larissa and Binas were in extreme shock. He asked, But that's... And staggered, falling to the ground. Larissa came to hold him, saying, Your Majesty. The boy continued, If you had just waited one more day, the entire empire would have been yours to claim. However, since you have already acquired a divorce, the imperial throne now belongs to someone else. Binas kept his hand on his mouth and uttered no, while raising his hand, the boy said, Yes, it belongs to none other than her imperial majesty, I know a salyard Cajun. He turned towards Binas and asked, Do you refuse to bow down to your new empress? Binas was in utter shock, unable to figure out what was happening. He exclaimed, This can't be. Ainoa started laughing and said, Ha! Huh. You heard him, Binas. She added, As your new empress, I demand you show me the appropriate courtesy. Binas got up and said, I refuse to do so. He clenched his teeth and leaned towards Anoa, screaming, You, the Empress? That is absurd. Until a moment ago, you were the Queen of Duran. Smiling, Anoa replied, And according to the Imperial Messenger, I am now the ruler of this empire. Why do you pretend to be ignorant of it, Binas? Irritated and furious, seeing her smiling, Binas said, This is preposterous. Larissa held him, saying, your majesty, and flooded her hair and said, You. It matters not whether you bow down to me or not, she added. I expected as much from you, ha! Huh? I'm sure you recall that when I married you, I brought with me a carriage full of gold as my dowry. Have it prepared at once, Binas, she asked. He questioned her. What? She added, for I plan to start off on my journey before the day is done just as you wanted. Seeing her so boldly, Binas started thinking. Have I ever seen such a cold expression on Ainoe's face before? 
Anoa turned towards him and screamed out. Binas, are you deaf? Don't tell me you meant to divorce me and keep my dowry too. Binas started trembling, clenched his wrist, and said, No! He staggered and fell down. Larissa held him, calling, Your Majesty. Arnold ordered him, saying, King Binas, I shall give you one hour. Prepare a carriage filled with gold. She added, If there is not enough gold in the treasury, scrape off the gilding on the soft walls and spires of the palace and pick off the jewels on the scabbards of the royal guards. Wait. If after confiscating the royal throne and crown, there is still room left in the carriage, I shall fill that space by cutting off the hair on your very heads. She leaned towards him and said, And of course, the pair of my mother's black diamonds on your heads. I must not forget about those. After saying this, he called the emperor's messenger, saying, Bell. He replied, Yes, your imperial majesty, your wish is my command. The royal servants started whispering, What's happening there? What will happen now? What on earth is happening here? Larissa hugged him and said, Your Majesty, Binas, what do we do now? He didn't reply, she again asked, Your Majesty. Meanwhile, Belle snatched her crown from her head, Binas screamed, Larissa! She's holding her head, screaming, Act! Binas asked her, Are you hurt? Binas screamed out loudly, What is the meaning of this? I've had enough of this insolence. How dare you? Bell held Binas's collar and snatched his crown from his head. Larissa asked him, Your Majesty, are you all right? He said, You may be a sorcerer, but you are nothing more than a lowly messenger. Binas sat down, clenched his hand, and said, King Binas, you have gone too far. He screamed out, This is an insult to the kingdom of Duran. Gazing at Binas, he questioned, And you have the audacity to talk of insults? In a fit of anger, he flipped off the crowns, causing them to break and scatter crystals and diamonds. Larissa witnessing the destruction gasped, My tiara! Black diamonds from the crown fell to the ground swiftly. The messenger gathered the black diamonds in his hands and addressed Larissa. Your Imperial Majesty! He smirked while swirling the diamonds in his hands. Anoa observing the scene was astonished. The messenger approached Anoa, took her hands, and politely stated, I've retrieved them, just as you desired. Smiling, he handed her the black diamonds and asked, Does that please you, Arnoa? Filled with gratitude, she responded, Yes, well done. She touched his face affectionately and declared, Let us leave this place. I've had enough of their foolishness. Meanwhile, Binas fell to his knees unconsciously. Larissa tried to support him, pleading, Come to your senses, your majesty. A concerned servant rushed to Binas and exclaimed, Your majesty, are you all right? Binas, bewildered, uttered, I don't understand what on earth is happening. I know, smiling, announced, Today has quite possibly been the most wonderful day I have ever experienced. I know was reminiscing about her past when her brother had trapped her in the tower. In the midnight, the castle was illuminating with lights. Her brother grabbed her hand and said while showing her the castle, Look before you, I know. I was in grief. He added, Everything you see, this place, the empire belongs to me. And as your ruler, I hold your very life in my hands. Never forget this fear. You'd be wise to suppress any spark of rebellion or ambition within you. He added, Always remember that your worthless life will be wiped out from existence the minute I let go of your arm. He was her brother Luciano, her half-brother who had locked her away in a tower as soon as the preceding emperor passed away. Then, as soon as she turned eighteen years old, she was married off to the king of Duran, she added, looking back. There was not even a valid reason for the marriage. Binas, the king of Duran, was more interested in my dowry than in me. After marrying him, she started thinking, but I found comfort in the fact that marrying him at least allowed me to be freed from that tower. I convinced myself that a little infidelity would not shake me. I only had to suffer through his efforts to shame me a few times a week, which I found tolerable. Then Larissa came into her life. However, we were fated to be together. I've never loved another woman in my life. 
Benaz was holding Larissa's hand and saying to her, Promise me you'll always stay by my side. Larissa replied, Your Majesty, I'm speechless with happiness. It was their wedding day. Larissa was dressed up in a pink royal dress. All the guests praised them. They make such a handsome couple that I feel a bit envious. They truly are a winning pair. Meanwhile, Anoa stepped in holding two glasses of wine. Everyone got shocked to see her. She said, Your Majesty, may I take my leave now? Benaz turned towards her and asked, What are you still doing here? Larissa reminded him, Do you not recall your Majesty? You asked Her Majesty the Queen to wake with our wine glasses. She hugged him and said, So that you could have the first dance with me. Benaz snuggled her and replied, Oh yes, I see. My queen has faithfully carried out my request. He scoffed at her and added, I didn't realize you were so obedient. It's not as if you're some servant. I thought you'd have more dignity than that. Larissa asked, Binas, whatever shall we do? Binas replied, I'm afraid her majesty had no idea. She added, That you wouldn't drink that wine anyway since it's been sitting out for too long. You've always preferred your wine chilled. Larissa, the daughter of Count Sti of Duran, the queen's chief lady-in-waiting, the king's first love and current mistress, on seeing them together, Anoa started thinking. I thought it was strange that I was given a lady-in-waiting so soon after my marriage. He just needed an excuse to keep Larissa close by. Anoa placed wine glasses back at the dish and said, Then I shall return to my chambers as I am not feeling well. Meanwhile, Benaz interrupted her by saying, What a shame, Larissa wanted you to enjoy the festivities with us. Larissa screamed out with excitement. Yes, we don't mind your presence here at all. She started rushing towards the stage and added, Please, you'll stay a bit longer. She sat on a chair and asked, Won't you? Benaz was standing beside her chair. She taunted, I know it, by saying, Although you'll have to stay on your feet as there is no seat for you here. I know left from the wedding running towards her room. She thought, Are all marriages this horrible? What did we go wrong? She reminded, Was it on our wedding night when Bina's left for Larissa's chambers as soon as the ladies-in-waiting were dismissed? At that time, when Bina said to her, Or was it when I overheard his lies about the night we didn't even spend together? The imperial princess was not so high and mighty standing naked before me. If I had to evaluate her, she received the lowest marks. She got trembled at that moment. She thought, or perhaps when Bina said, Larissa will remain in charge of household matters. If there is anything you need, be sure to get her approval first. She thought that and there was also when she stepped on her dress and fell down. Bina scolded her by saying, Are you blind? Larissa lost her balance because you stepped on her skirt. Thank heaven she did not fall. I know squeezed her dress and thought. Binas has always been an imbecile. Despite the challenges, I could bear it all as long as it meant I could escape that tower. She reminisced about her past when her brother trapped her in the tower. My half-brother Luciano despised me since the day I was born. Perhaps that was because he was envious of my mother's noble lineage which was more powerful than his own. She added, This was understandable as my mother, Anastia, was the matriarch of the Rickle family before her marriage to the emperor. She added, Father had always been of delicate health. After his death, I must have become a thorn in Luciano's side. Knowing this, I tried to keep out of his sight, staying with my mother's side of the family, but he dragged me to the palace as soon as he ascended the throne and locked me away in that tower. Yes, I'd rather be there than remain confined in that place. I would have willingly forgiven Binus for his senseless behavior. She twisted her arms and thought, except when he gave away that tiara and the jewel that adorned it. Those diamonds were a keepsake from my mother. She also received them as a gift from father when they were young. She added, So the value of those precious diamonds was already well known in high society, and of course, they were a part of my dowry. When I first saw Larissa wearing that tiara, I was furious. But after fury came fear. She disclosed her father's intentions, saying, 
When Count Sti saw his daughter at the king's side wearing the tiara embedded with that famous jewel, he aspired for his daughter to become queen. Since that day, I have been a target of ongoing assassination attempts. She added, Aside from being fed poisoned food, I lived under constant threat of attack. I could hardly sleep at night for fear that assassins would break into my chambers through the windows. I could die at any moment, so I lived in terror. Realizing Duran was no better than the tower, everything felt futile. I know put her hand on her head, took a sigh and said, How much more can I take? I'm at my wits end just surviving day to day. While opening the door, she started thinking, What can I possibly do to change any of this? I'll just toss more firewood in the fireplace for now and get a good night's. She saw a white beast in front of her and got astonished. How, huh, what's this? She thought, why is there a beast fast asleep in my chambers? Is this the Count's new plan to kill me? She stepped forward thinking, since the assassin he sent last time got caught, perhaps his new plan is to set a wild beast on me. Still, the beast was sleeping, and suddenly he flicked his eyes. My goodness, I've never seen such an enormous animal. I know thought. It's rather beautiful. The beast growled, and she got scared. Meanwhile, she slapped her head and realized. What was I thinking? Did the fatigue go to my head? She panicked and started rushing towards the door to escape. This is not the time to gawk. I should go out to the corridor and ask for help. She hurried towards the door in an attempt to escape. As she rushed, panic set in. Meanwhile, the beast awoke and lunged at her. Upon hearing its footsteps, she turned around, visibly terrified. In a matter of seconds, the beast charged at her, causing her to fall, with the creature standing over her. In the grip of fear, Princess Anoa questioned her fate as the leopard held her. How can this be? Am I to die like this? Suddenly, the leopard underwent a mystical transformation morphing into a human figure. The sorcerer, revealed to be Belle, stood before her and asked her, Is it you? He questioned the princess, bewildered and frightened, could only manage to ask, What on earth is happening? He's a sorcerer, and seeing as he is able to polymorph, he must be a very powerful one at that. What could he possibly be doing here? Sorcerers are known to keep to their own kind in the territory of Perhent. Answer me. Are you a Noah Sailyard Cajun? Sorcerer demanded. The princess, nodding her head in acknowledgement, awaited an explanation. All right then, on to business. Here, this letter is for you, he said, handing her a letter. Princess, still bewildered, questioned. A letter? Who would dash? As she took the letter from the sorcerer. Sorcerer, I was told he was a friend of yours, could it be? Princess, reading the letter, which says, Tell me whenever you wish to leave Duran. I'll find someone from the academy to put a curse on King Venus. She muttered, Anakin did. Anakin send you here? Sorcerer confirmed. Indeed he did. He was always an arrogant pest, even when we were students at the academy. Keep reading. The princess continued to read Anakin's letter with shock. My dearest friend, Annoy the Emperor and his successor have been assassinated. I've sent you a gift. Knowing you, I'm sure you'll be able to use it wisely. I sincerely wish you the best of luck. Your loyal friend, Anakin. Assassinated? Drat. Princess I know exclaimed, shocked at the news. Both of them at the same time? But that's impossible. The sorcerer interrupted, stating, That isn't even the real concern. Princess, now contemplating her situation, murmured, If the Emperor and his next in line are both dead, that means I'm the only heir left. However, her thoughts drifted to her marriage vows. I, I know a solid occasion, do hereby solemnly vow to become the Queen of Duran, pledging faithful obedience to my husband, agreeing to transfer all worldly wealth and titles under his name. Realizing the complications, she thought, that I am bound by my marriage vows, the emperor already had a successor, and I did not expect any title to be bestowed upon me. Regardless, the emperor and his successor are both dead, which means that imbecile will become the emperor. Were you and your brother on close terms, although you do look more angry than sad for that to be true? 
The sorcerer inquired, curious about the princess. My mind is preoccupied with various matters, that is all, he said, sensing the emotions of the princess. As the princess continued to read the letter, she found a line that caught her attention. I've sent you a gift. Is that the only explanation you're giving me, Anakin? So where is it? She questioned. Where is what? The sorcerer responded innocently. My gift, she pressed further. Are you disappointed that I came empty-handed? Perhaps I should have prepared a gift as an offer of my condolences. He teased. I know that is not what I mean. Do you truly have nothing else to give me? She clarified. I know I do not. The sorcerer affirmed. The princess, skeptical of the sorcerer's response, thought, he appears much too composed to have taken the gift for himself. Anakin must have had a reason for sending this letter, a letter and a sorcerer, at any rate, and asked the sorcerer about the circumstances that led him there. I was simply trying to be a good friend. The sorcerer explained. A good friend? According to Anakin, there existed no such thing as a good sorcerer, at least not within the halls of the Academy of Magic. If a non-sorcerer desires something from a sorcerer, he must always pay a price. He replied, I'd rather not delve into specifics. She interrupted. Or perhaps you were challenged to a wager. He turned, looking at her with anger. She smiled and said while holding the letter, It appears I am correct. A sorcerer's wager mandates acceptance if challenged by citing their full name, as ordained by the sorcerer's code. Are no emphasized. Winning the wager is no easy task. Sorcerers have lengthy, difficult names. And even if one were able to overcome that obstacle, most people end up losing the wager, paying the price with their life or losing something precious to them. However, Anakin was unlike most people expressing irritation. She stated, No surprises there. Then looked at the letter pondering. But why? Why would Anakin challenge you to a wager? The boy smirked and replied, I can't say for certain myself, our Noah contemplated Anakin's letter, said the emperor was dead, and the role of announcing his passing has always been reserved for the master of the enchanted tower. As the boys smiled at the situation, Arno realized and exclaimed, You are the master of the enchanted tower, he confirmed. It appears you truly are as clever as they say, adding, That is correct, I am here to fulfill my duty as the imperial messenger. Now where may I find a fellow named Binus? I must make myself useful to the Empire by delivering the news to him. Our Noah, serious question. Did Anna tell you to come to me before you met Binus? He affirmed. Yes. Placing the letter on the table, she presumed. I presume you decline if I were to seek a favor from you. He responded. Well, of course I would. It is no simple task to persuade a sorcerer to do your bidding. Concerned, she declared. Then I'm afraid I must challenge you to a wager. I'm hearing this, he said. A wager? How will you go about doing that when you don't even know my... He flinched when Arno added. Beltrius Dion Asco Repelation per Henerudi. Astonished, he questioned. What? She clarified. That is your name, isn't it? Beltrius Dion Asco Repelation Perheneridi, called Bell for short. Irritated, he turned, saying, Oh, Gannigan, that sly bastard, she insisted. Now you must join me in my wager. I know it, continued. The last thing I want is for Binus to sit on the imperial throne. If I win, Bell stood up from his chair, and she slipped the letter out of her hands, declaring, I shall acquire a divorce and become the empress myself. The letter dropped on the ground. Princess Anoa, with a fire in her eyes, expressed her grievances. What was my recompense for allowing Luciano to lock me away in that tower and then consign me to a marriage that was no better than exile? The servants under my command disappeared one by one, having been falsely accused of treason. I was the scapegoat of Luciano's rage and violent temper. Then I was subjected to Benus's mockery. And now my very life is in jeopardy, as Count Sti aims to have me assassinated. Luciano was the cause for all my suffering, and yet the fool died without even a successor. At this rate, Binus will ascend the imperial throne, 
and I shall become a nameless queen destined for even more humiliation. I must attain the sovereignty for myself. Turning toward Bell, the imperial messenger, she declared with authority, and you, the imperial messenger, shall acknowledge me as the new empress, the 28th master of the enchanted tower, and ruler of the territory of Prahent in the halls of the palace. Princess Anoa contemplated the mysterious figure before her, Bell, the master of the enchanted tower. She recalled the whispers and tales surrounding him. Bell, the master of the enchanted tower, she mused. I have heard some unverified rumors regarding him before. As the imperial messenger, Bell stood with an air of enigma. His unparalleled magical prowess was inherited from birth as the son of the esteemed sorceress Amaryllis, the twenty-sixth master of the enchanted tower. Despite his position as an imperial vassal, he remained elusive, much like many sorcerers who tended to live in seclusion, isolating themselves in a territory even the emperor dared not govern. They only emerged from their isolation to fulfill their duty as imperial messengers, honoring a covenant established in ancient times. Princess's mind wandered to the past, remembering a conversation with Anakin. Anakin had shared insights about Bell. One of my schoolmates is exceptionally talented. Intrigued, Princess inquired. Oh, do go on. He's a genius, yet he has no friends due to his horrible temper. He makes wagers with other students, depriving them of their wealth and magical powers, thereby rendering them unable to live as sorcerers any longer. Anakin explained, admiring the bravery of Bell. Shocked, Princess questioned. What? How can he be allowed to attend the academy after committing such misdeeds? Anakin continued. He was expelled, although it's uncertain whether it was due to his notorious behavior. He is said to have returned to Perhen after that, inciting the previous master of the Enchanted Tower into a duel, emerging victorious and claiming the tower for himself. As the pieces of the puzzle came together, Princess. I know his mind. She couldn't help but feel a mixture of curiosity and caution towards the enigmatic sorcerer standing before her. Belle broke the lingering silence, interrupting the princess in her thoughts. Your proposal is absurd. Do you even realize what you would be forfeiting if I won the wager? Bell questioned with a hint of skepticism. Our wager becomes official once you state what you desire from me, does it not? Princess responded calmly. Bell observed her demeanor. She appears not to be afraid of me at all. If she has heard anything of my reputation, she should behave with more caution. He thought. You are after my soul stone, the princess asserted. Are you truly willing to relinquish it? Pray, do you have any understanding of how it is made? Bell inquired. I do. Half of my life will be drained forming a beautiful jewel. It cannot be taken by force and must be given willingly. There exists a tiny bit of magical power in every soul stone, but the most powerful stone is one which is created from the life force of an imperial sorcerer. Sorcerers use these stones as a source of power explained the princess. Yes, you are well aware of its purpose and at what cost it is made. However, I am sorry to inform you that I cannot kill the king of Durand so that you may become the empress. The founding emperor of this empire was no fool. Bell clarified, highlighting the limitations imposed by the spell on the imperial messenger. Your offer is quite tempting, but I cannot accept this wager as it does not offer any possible gains, Bell asserted. But there is no provision that dictates when the news of the emperor's death must be delivered, is there? Princess suggested. While that is true, I prefer to rid myself of this hindrance as soon as I can. If there's longer than a month's delay in delivering the news, the succeeding emperor may hear it from another source, and that would be quite embarrassing for me. Bell explained. Fine, all that I ask. The princess tapped the table with force is for you to delay fulfilling your duty for just one month. Why? Bell questioned. So that I may acquire a divorce in the meantime, the princess declared. Acquire a divorce? Bell echoed, surprised. Yes, that is what I wish to wager. Whether or not I am able to obtain a divorce and claim the throne for myself, princess stated. 
In other words, you win the wager if you are divorced within the month. Bell summarized. Yes, and if I fail, I shall give you half of my lifespan. If I win, I shall become the new empress, and all that would be required of you is to fulfill your duty by declaring the news. Therefore, you stand to lose nothing even if you fail, the princess explained confidently. Then this wager has no merit. You dare to challenge the master of the enchanted tower yet seek no compensation? Bell questioned. You need not look so offended. There is merit in this for me as well. In order for the wager to proceed, announcing the news of the emperor's death must be delayed. Not only that, but if you want my soul stone, you will have to prevent any harm from befalling me, no matter how brash my behavior may be, princess reasoned. It appears you have ensnared me in a rather curious scheme. The wager was just a ploy to gain my support, was it not? Bell concluded, applauding the princess's strategic thinking. The princess merely smiled in response, her plan unfolding before her. The memory of a play orchestrated by the king to mock the princess lingers. Princess Arnia is vividly reminded of the painful spectacle. Mass, how dare you seduce his majesty? There is only one person who deserves to be by his side, and it's me, Arnia, the princess exclaims, snatching the missus' hair. Nanny, supplets your majesty, I shall bear the blame for it all, but please have mercy on my unborn child. She staggers, uttering desperately. The king intervenes sternly. Nanny, sir, speak no more. Princess Arnia tries to play alone, proclaiming her devotion, but the king silences her with a sharp command. Hold your tongue, Arnia. The king dismisses the absurdity of the play. This is ridiculous. Prospects for Duran's artistic pursuits appear bleak indeed. As the princess reflects on the humiliating performance, she recalls the audience's applause and the sinister motives behind it. This play was written to humiliate me, and I have no choice but to applaud. Is this their idea of amusement? The audience's reaction is mixed with some clapping enthusiastically while others murmur about Count Estia's relentless pursuit to make his daughter a queen. The princess wonders when the public will tire of this farce. Despite the disclaimer that the play is a work of fiction, she can't help but find the actor's name, Rick Tavian, suspiciously familiar. When will the public tire of this ludicrous play? Ahem. This performance was written as a work of fiction, unrelated to any real people or events. Whispers circulate within the audience, discussing the male actor's rising reputation. That male actor has been making quite a name for himself, but of course, he's rich Tavian after all. There are rumors of Countess Thea's illegitimate son performing in cheap melodramas, fueling speculation about the actor's true identity. The king, reveling in the mockery, acknowledges the actor. I was quite impressed with your acting. Your eyes were very expressive. The performer stammers out his gratitude. Th thank you, your majesty. To further humiliate the princess, the king turns to her, smirking. What say you, my queen? Was there any line in the play that you found particularly memorable? Perhaps you'd like to recite one of the queen's lines for us? That would be quite amusing indeed. Ha! Huh. As the royal court gathers for the commencement of the play, tension is palpable between Princess Anoa and King Venus with Larissa observing the unfolding spectacle. Princess Anoa, seizing the opportunity, addresses the king. As you wish, your majesty. If you allow me, would it be all right if I received some assistance from the star of the play? The king, wearing a smirk, responds, Please do. I must say, it has been ages since you have shown such enthusiasm. Rick, you may step forth. Rick, the star of the play, nervously approaches. It is an honor to make your acquaintance, your majesty, he says with a nod. Princess Anoa, with a mischievous glint in her eyes, instructs Rick to come closer. As he hesitates, she demands even more proximity, causing discomfort. It is true what they say. You truly are the most handsome man in all of Duran. You are just as I imagined you would be, she declares, leaving Rick shivering. Princess Anoa continues her theatrical performance. You carry yourself with such a majestic air that those in your presence cannot help but lower their heads in admiration. 
None can wear that deep purple hue with more grace than you, your majesty. King Benaz trembles with anger as the princess proceeds to place a ring on Rick's finger. This rich purple shade is the symbol of Duran's royalty. It is a color suited only for the bearer of this crown. Rick, now visibly distressed, stammers. Th this color symbolizes royalty. Only a person of royal lineage may wear purple. The audience begins to murmur. The princess, playing up the charade, slips the ring onto Rick's finger, stating, You are entirely correct, of course. That is why I wish to present you with this ring, whose elegant color suits you perfectly. Kindly accept it as a heartfelt gift from me, Anoa. She quickly corrects herself with a smirk. Oops. Oh, it was Anya, wasn't it? My apologies. I must now bring this act to a close. King Benaz, seething with anger, questions the sanity of the queen. Has the queen lost her mind? Princess Anoa continues talking to Rick. You may keep that sapphire ring as a gift for putting on such a fabulous performance. Rick, startled, attempts to remove the ring. Your Majesty, I will take off this ring right this instant. The audience reacts with shock. Larissa tries to intervene, claiming Rick had no intention of wearing the ring, but King Benaz has heard enough. He snatches the ring from Rick, ordering, Get this scoundrel out of my sight! Rick pleads for forgiveness, but the king remains firm. Princess Anoa, unfazed, glares back at the angry king. Glare all you want. You would not dare lay a finger on the imperial princess. As the guards escort Rick out while he screams for mercy, King Benaz, frustrated, declares, I shall return to the palace at once. Larissa rushes after him, but the princess, contemplating the unfolding chaos, thinks, What has Larissa SDI gained from being Benaz's first love? He mocks others all he likes but cannot stand being mocked in return. How can someone with such a self-centered attitude possibly rule over an entire empire? I managed to wound his pride, but that is hardly enough reason for a divorce. We shall see who prevails in the end. With a smirk, she moves away from the scene, leaving the palace in a state of turmoil. On the next beautiful morning, the sounds of chirping birds surround the palace. The royal trio, King Benaz, Princess Anoa, and Larissa, sit at the breakfast table. The king reads a newspaper article praising yesterday's play and the performance of its main lead character named Rick. The newspaper illustrates the exact dialogues of Princess Anoa about the main lead being the most handsome man in Duran, able to wear the color purple with grace, and possessing the majestic air of a king. King Benaz, unimpressed, exclaims, This is absolute drivel, and flaps the newspaper dismissively. Princess Anoa, with a mischievous gleam, pokes the king, asking, What is the matter, Binus? Were you not the one who wanted me to recite the lines from the play? The king, clearly irritated, retorts, As it appears, you have entirely abandoned any sense of propriety. I must remind you that you are a queen, and I expect you to behave accordingly, even if you were raised a naive princess who knows no better. Undeterred, Princess Anoa continues, cutting her steak, smirking, you need not remind me of my title. I couldn't possibly forget. As Larissa has been relentless in her quest to seize it from me. The king falls silent out of anger, and Larissa intervenes, trying to ease the tension. Your Majesty, Her Majesty the Queen seems a bit irritable today. Let us not concern ourselves with her and continue enjoying our meal. Here, would you like a taste? This is my favorite. Larissa lifts a piece of meat from her plate. King Benaz, touched by her gesture, responds warmly. You are as kind as you are beautiful, Larissa. I shall let you have the first taste. Larissa takes a bite and expresses her enjoyment. It's delicious, your majesty. Princess Anoa, observing the exchange with a glance, decides to take her leave, saying, Ha, I shall take my leave now. As she departs, King Benaz and Larissa share a moment appreciating the delightful meal. The atmosphere lightens, and the king exclaims, I'm certain it's delicious. They continue to enjoy their breakfast, seemingly unaffected by the earlier tension. In the quiet recesses of Princess Anoa's memories, a pointed conversation between her and her mother resurfaces. 
Princess Anoa's mother imparts wisdom. Remember, in order to win a servant's loyalty, you must only give one your undivided attention. A young and curious Princess Anoa inquires. Pardon me? Her mother, sensing the innocence in her daughter, asks. Are you all grown up, Princess? No. Princess Anoa hesitates before responding. I know. The mother continues her guidance. Then are you wealthy, just like your father or uncle or even myself? Princess Anoa, understanding her modest circumstances, replies. No, I'm not wealthy either. The mother leans in, sharing a profound truth with her daughter. I shall tell you something very important, so I want you to listen closely. Wherever you go, seek just one person who has the greatest potential to be your aid. The young princess, absorbing this advice, seeks clarification. Just one person? Her mother nods, emphasizing the significance. Yes, choose the smartest of the bunch, the smartest, and give that person all of your trust and affection so that they would even risk their life for you if you so desired. Tenderly, she pats Princess Anoa's head, leaving an indelible impression. In a quiet moment at the royal table, Princess Anoa and Belle engage in conversation. Princess Anoa reflects, Mother was absolutely right. Belle inquires, And your choice was Dr. Lutz? Princess elaborates on her decision. Correct. In a foreign kingdom with so many enemies, what one person could prove most useful to me? They would need to be able to detect any poison in my food, protect me from illness, and at times even aid me in keeping my enemies in check. In other words, a physician. She wasn't the court physician, but an apprentice. Dr. Lude stood out from the rest. She came from a family of scant means with many mouths to feed, and most importantly, she was a genius. Sorcerer Bell probes further. But is she truly poor? Royal physicians are paid handsomely, are they not? Princess clarifies. Not in the case of apprentices. In addition, her mother fell victim to an incurable disease, and Dr. Lutz was in desperate need of money for her treatment. The conversation shifts to a memory of Princess Anoa discussing plans with Dr. Lutz. Princess expresses gratitude. You have been an indispensable help, Dr. Lutz. Dr. Lutz replies. It was no trouble at all, your majesty. I'd do anything to please you. Princess discusses the contraceptive medicine. The contraceptive medicine you concocted worked wonderfully on Larissa. You may stop administering it to her now. Dr. Lutz questions. Is it no longer a concern whether she becomes pregnant? Princess reveals her true intentions. Actually, I need her to show symptoms which indicate pregnancy. Dr. Lutz asks about the timeline. How soon do you require her to have such symptoms? Princess sets the deadline. I need her to be diagnosed in three weeks' time. Are you up to the challenge? She punctuates her request with a smile. Dr. Lutz confidently responds. Of course, I'll get started on mixing the ingredients right away. Sorcerer Bell acknowledges. Quite competent indeed. Princess concludes the discussion about Dr. Lutz. As I told you, Dr. Lutz is a genius. I would not be alive to converse with you like this had it not been for her help. I'm sure Larissa is at a loss as to how I managed to survive all of her attempts to poison me. In a flashback, Larissa frustratedly questions her helper. Is this the best you can do? You told me she ingested the poison without a doubt. Why is she still alive? In the midst of their conversation, Belle drops an unexpected revelation. No, not the physician, you, princess. Taking a back, exclaims. Me? See aghast, Belle, maintaining an air of mystery, states. I must step outside momentarily. With a swift movement, he springs up. Princess, puzzled, questions. But where are you going? Belle, already in motion, leaps away. Princess is left with bewilderment. Mothers, he just comes and goes whenever he pleases, as if he was some kind of alley cat in a mysterious jungle setting. Belle engages in an unusual conversation with an animal. You were moving at a snail's pace. Did I not tell you to carry out your tasks promptly? Surprisingly, the animal transforms into a human, revealing Luca. Unfazed, Belle states, Luca, Luca, 
with theatrical flair, exclaims, You are too cruel! Do you really intend to nag me after all the time we've been apart? Are you not glad to see me, Belle? Pragmatic as ever, Belle replies, It has only been two days since I last saw you, Luca. Dramatically, Luca sighs, Well, it was the longest two days of my life. Ha! Huh. Cutting through the banter, Bell demands, Enough with all this chatter. What do you have to report? Back on track, Luca says, Oh, right. I am. There was a letter from Perhent this time. A boy from the Lopen family is showing the signs. Bell acknowledges. Yes, I also heard that on the way here. What else? With a mischievous grin, Luca adds, Oh, if you wish to hear some news regarding the Queen of Duran during your absence, she drove an entire theatrical company to ruin. Surprised, Bell questions, Did she truly manage that in the span of just two days? Luca nods, Yes, she is quite a terror, contrary to her appearance. Unfazed, Bell inquires, Have you captured it in the artifact? Luca promptly presents the artifact. I have it right here, although it is a bit blurry. I'm sure you're already aware, but Anakin always claims the entire stock every time new artifacts become available. Bell examines the artifact and comments, Wasn't she amazing? I witnessed the whole ordeal hidden just off the stage. The queen knew exactly the effect her words would have. It appeared to be all part of her plan. Luca agrees, Hmm, she certainly is competent. As Bell hands back the artifact, Luca adds, she desires to become the new empress, eh? She is better suited for the position than that fool Luciano, ah, uh, Master Belchurius. Bell responds, Yes. Alarmed, Luca points at the palace. I'm afraid I just saw. A tense moment unfolds as Luca reveals a band of assassins headed for the palace. Unaware of the unfolding danger, Princess greets Bell. Oh, Bell, you're back. Suddenly, chaos ensues. The scene is filled with the sounds of whooshing, thudding, and splashing. The assassins tries to kill the empress but Belle enters and save her. He said to her, It appears the palace guards are remiss in their duty. Where have they all gone? The assassins moves toward him and attacking him shouts. Die. While fighting with assassins he said, Yes, I expected as much. Judging by this sudden appearance of dagger-wielding assassins, and how they leapt three stories without a moment's hesitation. I was right. The guards were instructed to abandon their posts. Seeing this all Empress said, Their relentlessness never ceased to amaze me. I am the Queen of Duran. Is this the treatment I deserve? Bell comes to her and holding her hand he said, You are hurt. She seeing her injured hand replied, It's nothing. I'll just have the wound cleaned and have Dr. Lutz take a look at it in the morning. He grabbed her hand and then said her to, Hold still. He starts healing her wound with magic, she asked to him. Do you also possess the power to heal? He replied while healing her wound. Only as much as needed in the present. He continues, is this Count Estia's doing? To make his daughter a queen? She nods her head. Bell holding his chin said, Would it not be simpler to have the king killed? She with a nervous face said, What? Bell in a cold tone said, It's true. Is it not King Binas is what stands in your way? All of your troubles will be solved if he ends up dead like Luciano and Arian. He inquires, have you not attempted to because I refused to do it for you? She replied. No. Bell said. With Dr. Lude's help surely you could. She interrupts saying. That's not it. Bell said. It can't be Bacchus he's your husband. She replied. The reason I act not do it is because Binas has a nephew who is his successor. Bell gets confused and said. A nephew? She nod her head and replied. Yes. She explains the situation to Bell saying. Meaning if he dies before the divorce, I will be nothing more than a widowed queen. 
It would be a sight to see to have that unruly brat seated on the imperial throne. She holding her head said, What a headache that would be. Bell said, Then have that ten-year-old taken care of first. She said, You are forbidden from inflicting any sort of harm on Dr. Ludes, or his nephew, unless I give you the word. If you kill anyone without my permission, I will consider it an act of sabotaging our wager, and you can forget about receiving a soul stone from me. Bell replied, Yes, we had a wager. It completely slipped my mind. That's, she said, we shall proceed on my terms. Bell with a sigh said, Fine, but I also have a request. She inquires, What is it? Bell show her a golden stone, she said. That is a mystic eye, isn't it? Why are you giving that to me? Bell replied, It's the only artifact that allows a particular enchantment to be cast on it. That gem is part of a pair. When one gem is worn, it allows the person who downs it to witness the actions of the person wearing its counterpart. He giving that to her said, Always wear it around your neck. She with a nervous face holding the stone said, Thanks you. Someone moving towards her room shouts, Why you, your majesty? Is everything all right? She gets confused and nervous. Bell said, I see the palace guards are finally coming to your rescue. She asked him. Quick you must morph into another form. Bell said. What? Wait. She said. Hurry. The guards enters and shouts. Your majesty, we have come to save you. Meanwhile she was standing there alone. She turns back with a cold look while standing in front of dead bodies. She said. Is something the matter? One of guards said. She's still alive? While others seeing him alive gets nervous and surprised. He said to her. W.E. discovered traces of an intruder. I'm relieved to see. That you are. Safe. She with a cold look said. I'm all right. Even though you have all failed to protect me. The garad said. Please forgive us. While one of them noticed something and holding his sword he shouts. A trespasser. Empress shouts. W wait, that's. Meanwhile a cat enters and seeing it everyone gets shocked. One of the guards said. Oh. While seeing the bell in cat's form he said. What's a cat doing here? Meanwhile in the next scene we saw a camp. A man holding another man shouts. Aroxan, while a redhead girl was standing in front of them. The man places his knife on neck of other man. He begs for his life saying, Please spare me my life. I beg you. Captain, the man said to redhead girl. The request made by Kessman is not a substantial one by any means. In addition, I have no desire to kill your betrothed. I beseech you to reconsider the terms of our peace agreement. This is a meaningless war, and we want to cease. Meanwhile she pull out her arrows and the man seeing this shouts. W wait. WH what are you doing? She with a cold look moves her arrow towards them the man shouts. What is the meaning of this? Do you intend to kill your own intended? Her betrothed shouts. Put that down. Do you mean to kill me? Roxanne, please. Have you forgotten that I'm your intent? Meanwhile she kill him with her arrow. Seeing this the man gets shocked and said. She killed him with her own hands. She with a cold tone said. Kill them all. In the next scene we saw a palace with red flags. A man grabbing a glass of juice said. How foolish of them. Did they really think we would accept a peace agreement? He was the Grand Duke Asselier Roxanne's father. Roxanne said, Those dimwits from Kessman didn't know what hit them, father. She grabs the glass of wine, her father said. Were you hurt? She replied, Of course not. But, 
she sighed and said to her father, Please pick someone better as my intended next time, father. Listening this her father gets confused. Her father starts laughing and said, I will keep that in mind, but right now, she in a cold tone said to her father, We have a more important objective to discuss. All right, then what happened with the assassination of Emperor Luciano? Her father with a nervous face replied, Actually, that is precisely what I'd like to speak with you about. There was a setback. Luciano died as we had planned. But that imbecile Arian died as well. I didn't expect the bot to be such a ravenous simpleton that he's eat poisoned food. She gets furious and said, What do you mean Arian died? Her father said, Unfortunately, it's true. Our plan to make Arian a figurehead failed. She clegged her hand. She furiously shouts, How could you be so careless? You should have prevented him from dying. Was it that hard to keep the dullest member of the family alive? Her father sighed and replied, Worry not, my daughter. Our plan isn't over yet, for this is just a trivial setback. This merely means we'll have a different nitwit sitting in the throne. She turns and said, So the crown goes to King of Duran. Her father explains, Yes, for the imperial princess Arnoa gave up all PF her rights two years ago. SHW will become nothing more than his wife and empress. This is nothing to be concerned about. Unlike you, she is a weak, ordinary girl. She steps forward to Mirror and said, Imperial Princess Arnoa. What was she like? Was she really just a weak, ordinary girl like my father says? No. She was more like. Her father taps her shoulder and said, Do not forget. You are my daughter, my flesh and blood. You're the most capable person in the empire and the future empress. He said, So what if you don't come from a royal family? The Asselier family's lineage surpasses that of the imperial family's direct descendants by far. Her father said, I was not able to sit on the throne. But I will make sure you do. She said, The master of the enchanted tower should deliver the news to the king of Duran in a few days. Her father replied, Yes, maybe he has already been notified. She said, He does not have a slightest idea in how heavy the emperor's crown is. She placing her hand on Mira said, I shall let that halfwit from Duran know his place. I will make him understand the difference between a king and an emperor, and who truly wields power within the empire. Changing scenes we saw a garden full of flowers. Three girls having tea sits there. One of them said, Is that true, Dana? I can't believe Her Majesty was so infatuated with Rick Tavian she even gave him the very ring symbolic of the royal family of Duran. She giggles and said, That's hard to believe. She didn't strike me as the type to do such a thing. Meanwhile the other girl wearing a yellow dress said, I am telling the truth. I didn't know she was even capable of smiling. I am certain Rick Tavian won her heart. Larissa with a smile on her face said, What an embarrassing scandal. It seems that Her Majesty still doesn't know how to conduct herself in Duran. As ladies-in-waiting, we must teach Her Majesty how to meanwhile someone opens the door. Larissa turns and said, Who dares to enter my greenhouse unannounced? Empress enters wearing a purple dress and said, I see you're enjoying tea time in my absence. The girl in yellow dress stands and bows saying, Your Majesty. Larissa with an evil smile said, Oh, Your Majesty. It's considered rude to barge in unannounced, and on your own, no less. Empress said, I was invited, and the door was closed. What other choice did I have? Larissa replied, Well, you could have had a servant open the door for you. After all, we didn't want mother to get upset again. The empress replied, I intended to, but all my servants were having a tea party. Hearing this, the girls get shocked. 
Empress in her thoughts said. The way she uses the same tricks repeatedly is just like her father. Count Estia, Larissa's father, tearlessly produced the same play over and over again, and attempted the same assassinations repeatedly without ever growing weary. Larissa held tea parties with similar schemes each time as well. She would invite Aranoe as if she were concerned about Aranoe feeling lonely. Then she'd insult Aranoe for hours, put strange things in her food, and laugh at her after gifting her gaudy outfits. Larissa, with a smile on her face, said, Your Majesty, where is the dress I gifted you? I chose it with great care. Was it not to your liking? Just like she is doing right now. Empress replied, No, it was an eyesore. Larissa said, How could you say such harsh words? Are you implying that you have a problem with my taste? Empress replied, Implying? No, I'm telling you you have terrible taste. Take a look at your hideous dress, for instance. Larissa gets shocked and said, You excuse me? Empress said, Let's see what rubbish you have served today. This is rather fun. Empress taps the cup and said to her servants, Isn't it a servant's duty to pour tea? Her servant leaned and said, Forgive my impertinence, your majesty. Perhaps this fragrance will lighten your mood. While seeing the tea changing its color Empress thoughts. It changed color. She must have coated the cup with something. She sips tea and gets shocked, she said in her thoughts. It's spicy. One servant asked her. Is the tea to your liking? While the other said. It has a sweet aftertaste. The first one said. It's an excellent tea. Empress sighed and said, It tastes awful. Perhaps my sense of taste is a bit off. Larissa said, I'm afraid you're right. Your lack of taste for finer things worries me, your majesty. She snickered and said, You must know how to enjoy the finer things if you want to win the heart of his majesty. I'm touched that my precious lady-in-waiting is looking out for me. What kind of queen would I be if I didn't reward such behavior? She grabs Larissa's face and said to her, Drink. This is a reward for my chief lady-in-waiting. She pours the tea forcefully in her mouth. Larissa starts coughing. Cough. She starts sweating and shouts. I it's spicy. It's burning my tongue. She shouts. Water. I need water. Meanwhile, Empress pours tea in cup. Larissa snatched cup from her hand, saying, Give me that. She starts drinking that without seeing what it was. She suddenly gets shocked, breaking the cup, she shouts. Arg, this is the same tea. Empress with a smile on her face said, What's the matter, Larissa? I thought you enjoyed finer things. A lady enters shouting. What is this commotion about? Larissa starts crying and dash towards the lady and shouts. Mother. Her mother replied. Larissa, my dear. Meanwhile, Empress in her thoughts said. I was wondering when Countess Estiae would arrive. Larissa said. Sob, mother. Her mother asked her. Who did this to you? She replied. Her Majesty did. Larissa's mother furiously said. What is the meaning of this? Empress replied. Is it not obvious? Meanwhile, and she said in her thoughts. I'm glad she's here. Empress said to Larissa's mother. She served me some wonderful tea, so I rewarded her accordingly. In her thoughts, she said. She will help me make my point. Larissa's mother scoffed and said. Forcing her to drink against her will hardly seems like a reward. It's downright barbaric. Larissa's mother asked Empress. I expected more from a member of the imperial family. You must be punished for your actions. She said to Empress. Show me the back of your hand. Empress in her thoughts said. This family sure loves to repeat themselves. 
and move her hands towards her. Empress in her thoughts said, But this time, Larissa's mother trying to hit Empress said, Hold steady. Seeing this Larissa gets happy and laugh. Empress pulling her hand back said, I will not play along. Which caused Larissa's mother to hit herself. She shouts with pain. Ark. Empress laughing said, Are you alright? Perhaps you could try a gentler swing next time. Larissa's mother tremble and said, You can't pull your hand back when you're getting punished. Her mother said, You've really learned nothing in the past two years, have you? Empress replied, You're right. Her mother asked, P pardon me? Empress said, Like you said, I have learned absolutely nothing from you. Oh, but I do remember one thing. You told me that the queen is in charge of the royal staff, and that I can hire or let go of anyone I want. Listing this Larissa's mother gets shocked. She turns and shouts. That's enough from you. I shall return to the palace and inform his majesty of what happened this instant. Empress replied. There's no need for that. You are relieved of your duties, countess. Larissa's mother shouts. Oh, what grounds, Empress said. Your incompetence is reason enough. Considering the amount of gold you're paid, you should have done a better job of teaching me. Larissa's mother said. It's your fault you didn't learn a thing from me. Empress spin her hairs and said. You have failed me. Your indifference made me the barbaric person I am today. Is it not a teacher's job to lead student on the right path? Before I show myself out, here's another act of barbarism. She Aegean pours the tea on Larissa's head and said, Larissa, thank you for the lovely tea party. Larissa starts shouting, Eek. Mother, I need water. Meanwhile seeing this the servants said, My poor darling. She seems like a different person. Maybe she has gone mad. Meanwhile Empress starts laughing and said, That felt great. She noticed a red rose, she picked it, and smelled it. Meanwhile Belle seeing this from a near place starts laughing. Wahaha. Luca said to him, Show some self-control, Master Belcherius. Is it that funny? We're in the middle of the palace. Bell was sitting on a tree and holding his golden stone, he said. It's okay. We're invisible. Luca replied. My stealth magic has its limits. Why make me cast it? It's not completely soundproof. Bell said to Luca. Do you want me to stop training you? Luca replied. No, master. Luca grumbled and said. What could be so funny about a tea party? Bell replied, you missed all the fun parts. Luca replied, only because you didn't let me watch it with you. Bell said to Luca, focus on your training. She is a delight to watch. How has she been hiding her true nature all this time? Luca turns and said, is she not hiding her true nature anymore? Bell said, no, she's being herself. Luca ponder and said, Honesty rarely pays off for non-sorcerers. It usually gets them killed. Bell holding his golden stone necklace said, Only those who are thoughtlessly transparent meet a dreadful end. But her intentions are clear. Luca said, But isn't it bad for you if she's the meticulous type? Suddenly Bell remembers something and gets shocked. Luca said, I thought you had a wager with her for Soul Stone. Luca reminds him about the wager saying, I thought the two of you had a wager. You should keep her from getting divorced if you want her Soul Stone. Bell gets nervous and clench his golden necklace. He said, Luca. Bell flicked his finger causing Laka float and said, When did you become so talkative? It's unattractive. Luca said, Oh, why did you do that? Luca fell down and said, You scoundrel. Anyway, 
Bell said. I'll keep watching her and the future she paves for herself. Meanwhile in the palace Larissa starts crying while lying on her bed. King Binas sitting beside her said. Stop crying Larissa. She with tears on her face said. Does it not make you injury your majesty? The queen made a fool out of me. Binas in furious look shouts. Of course I'm furious. Larissa sniffle and said to King Binas. Then why are you still keeping her in the palace? Is your love for me fading? King Binas replied. Of course not. He hugs her and said. I told you. You're my first and last love. But it's difficult to divorce a member of the imperial family. He raised his hand and said. Such hardship. Fate has never been kind to us. Larissa said. God must be jealous of our love. King Binas replied. We must stay strong. She with tears on her face said. So are you going to let this go unpunished? King Binas gets shocked and replied. I will do no such thing. He holds her hairs and said. I will make her pay for making you cry. She will learn her lesson at the upcoming Festival of Souls and realize that to wrong you is to wrong me. Binus smirk and said, Get ready for the spectacle of the century. Changing scenes we saw two ladies laughing while seeing Empress dress. One of them said, Look at the queen's dress. It looks like it was in fashion a century ago. I heard it was bestowed by His Majesty himself, not Larissa. His Majesty must be quite angry. Empress thought. So you've heard about the tea party incident. Gossip all you want. Meanwhile someone said. The first song has come to an end. A round of applause for the most beautiful couple. King Binus said to Larissa. You and I are a match made in heaven. We even dance well together. She replied. It's because you taught me so well. Meanwhile, Empress Anoa comes and bowing said, Your Majesty. They turns towards her King Binus said, The dress suits you. It truly captures the solemnity of a queen. What a thick and heavy fabric. It's as if my great aunt has come back to life. Larissa said, Those fake purple pearls are a good look on you, Your Majesty. Meanwhile, Empress in her thoughts said, I couldn't care less for their meager insults. I wonder if you're watching me right now. Bell. Two days before the festival. A cat walks in Empress room while she was trying the dress. She noticed him and said, Bell? Bell transforms into his original form and said, I told you you should never remove the necklace. I need you to wear it at all times if I am to protect you until the end of our wonger. Empress replied, Did you come all the way here just to tell me that? I took IT off so I could change in front of a mirror. Bell said to her, Did you even look in the mirror? Because that dress is ghastly. She replied, It's MY outfit for the Festival of Souls. Binas gave it to me saying that he wants me to dress the way his great aunt who died 100 years ago did. Bell noticing her gown said, must you wear that abomination? Have you no other gowns? She replied. I appreciate your concorn, but it's a fitting dress for the mad queen. And I wish to put people off. You, Bell said. Keep saying you're mad, but you're not. She replied while Bell steps forward to her. Pardon me? Is it so crazy to say that an actor beloved by the whole nation is handsome? When the king parades his mistress around the court? Is it so crazy to punish a lady in waiting for insulting her queen? I don't think it insane at all to discharge that sadistic teacher of yours. She clenched her hand and said, Common sense has no place in. Bell interrupts her saying, You should be enraged. It is only natural to have done what you did. There's no need to call yourself mad. She flicked and said, I thought sorcerers were heartless. She turning back said, I see your point. 
I will no longer call myself mad, for I am not. Bell said, The festival tonight, is it not? Does one have to be a noble to be invited? She replied, Yes, one must hold a title or be related to someone who does. Bell said, If that's the case, that invitation is of no use to me. He points his finger towards the red rose and said, I'll have that instead. Empress gets confused and said, You want me to give you this rose? If you wish to have one, there are plenty of them in the garden. Bell said to her, There are, but I want the one you've picked. She sighed and replied, You're rather juvenile. She gave him the rose and said, This one is withered. Bell smelling the rose said, To me, it is more beautiful than any other flower. Binus said, I'm afraid you're a tad bit late. I have already picked my partner. Arnoa said, I do not need a partner. Binus interrupts saying, But worry not, I have found you another. Why don't you greet him first? You'll be dancing with him all night, after all. Binus's distance relative Marquis Robert Dine. Arnoa said, Marquis Dine. While the guest starts whispering, isn't he that awful scoundrel who uses dirty tricks to get any woman he sets his sights on into his bed? Marquis Bowen said, It's an honor to be your partner, your majesty. Arnoa turns her head and said, At least someone is happy about this arrangement. Could it be that your majesty has two left feet? Perfus that is why the king F refers the tender company of Larissa. Marquis said, Allow me to soften up your stiff body. He said, Even the most frigid shrew couldn't turn down a real man like me. He grabs Arnoa from her back and said, Not even you, your majesty. He trying to kiss her said, Let us dance. Meanwhile Arnoa hits her neck and he shouts, Huh! Arg! Arnoa said, it's quite simple to overpower someone with their guard down. You D.O.D.'d have to be a real man to do that. She grabs him from her hair and said, My apologies. I'm the one who is playing the palace troublemaker these days, not you. She stomped his feet with her heel. He shouts, A.R.G.H. Bina said, What do you think you are doing to my guest? Arnaud with a smile said, the Marquis acted impertinently first. Binus said, He was merely jesting. Why must you overreact like that? You really have lost your mind. She spins her head and said, Why don't you punish me then? Binus furiously said, I'm not to be trifled with. You think you can belittle me just because you are from the Imperial family? He looking towards the servants up there holding dirty water said, Let's see how long you can keep up that attitude. Servants said. Quickly pour it on her before she walks away. Arnoa in her thoughts said. I can't believe he planned such a childish prank. She clenched her hand and said. Fine, I will use this to my advantage. Meanwhile servants splashed the dirty water. Arnoa said. It will be easier to act crazy when I'm wet. Meanwhile, Bell enters and save her from water by giving her a raincoat. Seeing him, Arnoa said, Bell? Bina seeing Bell asked, Who are you? How dare you? You lay a land on the queen. Bell replied, What do you mean? I merely saved my partner from a rather difficult situation. Bina starts trembling and Bell said, As this is a joyous occasion, Please demonstrate your great generosity and grace, your majesty. He grabs her hand and said, My queen, I am sorry I am late. Bell kissed her hand and said, Allow me to escort you, your majesty. Arnoa seeing him gets shocked and said, How did you? Bell giving red rose to Arnoa said, This is for you? As Arnoa touched the rose its color starts changing she said, the color of the roses. Suddenly her cloths changed and rose turns blue. 
Guests seeing this get shocked and asked. The queen's gown changed. What is happening? It was red velvet until seconds ago. She looks so much better now. Arnoa whispers to Belle. Are you crazy? Belle whispers back. Do you not like it? Arnoa said. I'm not talking about the gown. You can't use magic out in the open. He replied. I didn't. That's just an artifact artifact magic. Arnoa said. It all looks the same to people. We should leave immediately. Meanwhile, Belle grabs her and said. I told you. That I would escort you. Arnoa said. Yes, you did, but it's time to run. They come outside and Arnoa asked her. Why did you help me? Bell, removing his mask, said. Because you asked for the protection. Arnoa turns and said. I don't need you to protect me from getting splashed with dirty water. She turns back towards him and said. It would have made my mad queen act more persuasive. She holding the rose said, Belle, Did you help me to sabotage my plan to obtain a divorce? Belle replied, If that's how it seemed you are free to believe so. He spinning her hair said, I suppose it fits your character. Nonetheless, You are the only one who protects me around here. She said, Thank you. In the next scene we saw Binus, he said, She's gone mad. Utterly mad, I tell you. He asked the servant, you there. Tell me your thoughts. What did you think of the queen yesterday? He replied. Ah, uh, she was beautiful, your majesty. Bunis said. You buffoon. I couldn't care less about how she looked. I'm talking about her behavior. How could she let herself be escorted by another man right in front of me? The servant replied, But Marquis Dine did so by your order. Binus gets angry and said, Not him. I meant the man in the mask. The servant replied, That handsome man. Binus gets furious and shouts, He's no doubt ugly under his mask. Binus said, Did you find out which estate he is from? The servant said, Yes, your majesty. He is Count Lurk of Lurk Estate. Binus said, That can't be right. I know Count Lurk. I used to attend lessons with him in the palace when I was young. The servant said, I'm afraid Count Lurk's estate and title were purchased by someone yesterday. Binus said, Who could possibly buy the fourth largest estate in Duran? He clenched his hand and said, I'm sure the queen is behind all this. It's all her doing, I am certain of it. The servant said, Why would she do that? Binus holding his chin said, Jealousy? She is trying to get me to become jealous. She must be looking for other ways to get to me now that she can't harass Larissa anymore. Do you remember Rictavian? It is obvious she was using him to make me jealous. It all makes sense now. Pathetic woman. Meanwhile a servant enters and shouts. Your Majesty. A carrier pigeon just arrived from Kessman. Do you remember deploying our soldiers to aid in the war between the Imperial Army and Kessman? Binus gets shocked and said, Of course. It was the Emperor's order. The letter says Grand Duke Asselier is forming a special force made of our Duranian soldiers. The special force of Grand Duke Asselier. They were established by the Grand Duke himself. Acting as Commander-in-Chief the Grand Duke uses them to eliminate anyone who gets in his way. And when their service is no longer needed, they're sent to the front lines to die. Binus said, Did the emperor order this himself? The servant replied, I cannot say for sure. Binus asked, Could this be about the queen? The servant replied, It is a possibility. Why else would the Grand Duke threaten Duran like this? Even though they're not on good terms, she is the sister of the Emperor. It might bother His Imperial Majesty that she is still not blessed with the love of Your Majesty after two years of marriage. Damn that leaves only one option. Changing scenes we saw Binus getting ready he said. I suppose I'll have to save the day. 
tell the ladies in waiting to get her ready. Arnoa said to her servant who was brushing her hairs, What exactly are you doing? She replied, Isn't IT fragrant? Rose perfumed oil does wonders for your hair. Laddie Larissa puts this on every day. Arnoa said, That is not what I asked. Why are you doing all this to me? Servant replied, I told you, it's the king's order. Let me spray you with this perfume Lady Larissa uses. It's his majesty's favorite. Arnoa said to her, If you get a single drop of that on me, I will have your hand cut off. The servant bows and said, I'll take my leave now, your majesty. Arnoa in her thoughts said, Isn't it enough that he's making me put on all this makeup? Why must he make me go along with his preferences? What game is he playing at? Meanwhile, Binas knocked the door and said, My queen? He enters holding a rose in his mouth, said, The preparations took quite some time, I see. She seeing him get shocked and said, Eek. What are you doing in my chambers? And why are you not dressed? She closed her eyes and said, It's repulsy, I mean it is inappropriate. So this was what he was up to. Binas said tonight, I shall give you what you've been longing for. Arnoa gets shocked and asked, What are you talking about? Binas replied, You didn't have to harass Larissa and put on a display with another man at the ball to ask for my love. She gets chilled and said, Wait, are you offering? Binas blinked his eye and said, Correct. You may have my body. Arnoa said, Um, I do not want it. Binas said, Let's make an air while we're at what? You need not play coy anymore. You have my permission to indulge in your lust for me. Arnoa said, Get away from me. Meanwhile, Bell and Cat Form enters and Sakrat attacking Binas. Meow. Arg. UTGH. What is this cat doing here? How dare you scratch me? Arnoa leaned and held the cat and said, Ow. Stop, Snowy. Come here. Arnoa said to Binas, Listen carefully, your majesty. If you ever try smelling like this again, you might end up like Marquis Dine. Binas said, Are you saying you will break my foot? She with a smile said, Perhaps your foot will be broken, or perhaps your tool for siring in air. Try me if you're curious. Binas gets nervous and run away saying, Why you're a mad woman? The cat said, Meow. Arnoa holding him said, Turn back to human form. No one will come here for a while. It's fine. Meow. Bell transformed back to his original body and the hugged accidentally. She said, oops, sorry about that. Bell said to her, this is why I told you to let me go first. Bell hugs her and said, this is why I told you to let me go first. Did you not hear me a moment ago? She thoughts. A moment ago? Was he trying to say something when he was meowing? She steps back and said, Anyway, why did you do that? Bell replied, What do you mean? She said, You attacked Binus. I thought, as the messenger of the Empire, you are not allowed to harm or kill the next Emperor. Bell whistled and replied, It's okay to scratch him with claws. He waves his hand and said, as long as I don't harm him with magic. She replied, But why? You were supposed to keep me from getting a divorce. She said, Don't you want my soul, Stone? Bell folding his hands replied, Didn't you hear that the master of the enchanted tower is capricious? I'm famous for doing whatever I want, as fickle as the wind. He countenues, just now I felt like giving the king a good scratch, so I did. If somehow there were not a contract of magic between the sorcerers and the imperial family, I would have killed him right then and there. Changing scenes we saw a raccoon dashing from arrows. King Binas getting furious shouts. 
That little vermin. Meanwhile his servants said, That was a great shot, your majesty. Even the best archers have a hard time hitting a nimble creature like that. It's true. Raconos are even trickier to hunt than bears or boars. Maybe it's time to find another game. Meanwhile a servant said, Oh no. Was it another shot and miss your majesty? Why did you have to go after that raccoon when there were other, easier targets? You are already out of arrows. Would you like me to give you the raccoon I caught? King Binas gets furious and grab him from his cloths, Binas said in anger. Silence. Shut your mouth. Other servant trying to save him from Binas said to Binas. Have mercy, your majesty. He is new and has a lot to learn about manners. Binas in his thoughts said, That darn cat, the raccoon, and now even this little brat. They're all mocking me. As if I wasn't already frustrated trying to comfort Larissa who burst into tears. Binas asked to Larissa while she was crying lying on bed. It's not like that. She replied. You have betrayed me. King Binas in his thoughts counted him. After hearing that I went to Arnoa's chambers. Arnoa. He recalls the moment when he goes to Arnoa's chamber. She said to Binas. Listen carefully, your majesty. If you ever try something like this again, you might end up like Marquis dying. She in a cold look said. Perhaps your foot will be broken, or perhaps your tool for siring in air. Try me if you are curious. Binas thoughts. Did she mean it? I wanted to have an here with imperial lineage. Hold on, speaking of hires. Why is Larissa not getting pregnant? He gets nervous and said, Am I at fault? That can't be. I am the great king of Duran. Meanwhile a raccoon snatched something from him. He gets shocked and tremble. He said, Why you? He shouts, You damned raccoon! His servants said, Why your majesty? Changing scenes we saw Arnoa standing there with a bow and arrow smiling while holding her chin. Larissa comes and asks Arnoa, Is this your first hunt, your majesty? She wearing a red dress said, His majesty brings me along quite often. Arnoa in her thoughts said, Here we go again. Arnoa said to her, I have been to hunts at the Imperial Palace and Duke Rickles Manor. Larissa asked her, Have you ever shot an arrow? She tells to Arnoa, I learned how to use a bow from his majesty. She glares and said, Before your majesty even came to Duran. Arnoa in her thoughts said, Foolish girl. No matter how much you brag about how close you are to Binus, you won't get a rise out of me. Perhaps it rubbed you the wrong way that Binus came to my chambers. But I won't let you step all over me. Arnoa replied to Larissa, you should find another teacher if you're serious about learning archery. She shouts. Are you mocking him? His majesty is the finest warrior of Duran. Arnoa replied. Duran is doomed if its finest warrior is unable to take down a mere raccoon. Larissa leaned and said. Your majesty must be a master archer to be making fun of his majesty. If you are so good with bows, would you have a competition with me? Larissa said. By the way, I once won against the royal guard. Meanwhile in her thoughts she said. How good could Arnoa be at archery? She smirked and Arnoa said. It is an interesting suggestion. But what would we shoot at? There are no targets. Larissa replied. We are on a hunting ground, are we not? Let us compete with how much we catch today. Meanwhile the guard interrupts saying. Um, it's almost time to retire. Larissa with a funny face said. Oh, would you look at the time? It's too late for you to start hunting. I followed the knights and shoot a rabbit a minute ago, but your majesty was busy taking a long break at the camp. Arnoa steps forwards and said. 
I didn't know shooting a rabbit that was caught in a trap someone else set up counted as hunting. Arnola in a cold tone said, I heard a knight had to help you because you couldn't even finish killing it. You also ruined its skin, didn't you? Larissa gets furious and said, W.H. what? Of it? That's still more than you. She said, If your majesty is so confident, hunt something bigger than a rabbit. I will approve of your majesty's archery skills if you manage to hit an animal with an arrow at least once. Arnoa replied, Your approval means nothing to me unless you're going to apologize for your rude behavior the last time. Larissa starts trembling and said, Ha! Did your majesty say, apologize? She thoughts in her mind, why would I apologize to a powerless queen? There's no way she can shoot better than me. She's been stuck in the palace for the last two years. Larissa said, fine. But if I win, you do the same, your majesty. I want you to apologize for what you did to me and my mother. Arnoa with a smile holding her chin said, Hit an animal bigger than a rabbit once, huh? Don't you think it's a dumb wager? Larissa gets shocked and said, Pardon me? Arnoa explains, Bigger animals are harder to kill with just one shot, but landing an arrow on them should be much easier compared to small critters. Larissa leaned towards her and shouts, Just go to the forest and start shooting, your majesty. King Binus comes and interrupts them, saying, How about postponing the competition until the hunt next month? It's getting dark. Larissa, with an evil smile, said, Worry not, sir. Her majesty is brave enough to go into the forest by herself. She countenanced, mocking her, saying, Or is it? Too frightening, your majesty? Give up if you would like. It would not be the first time you lost to me. Meanwhile, Arnoa pulls out the arrow and said, I don't need to go into the forest. Larissa said, Excuse me? Arnoa flipped the arrow. She in a cold tone said, There's no need to waste everyone's time when there is an animal bigger than a rabbit right in front of me. Larissa gets shocked and said, Hold on, what are you doing? Arnoa replied, What does it look like? I'm hunting. She pulls the arrow and pointed towards Larissa and said, What does it look like? I'm hunting. Larissa gets shocked and shout, Why you wouldn't? His majesty will punish you if anything happens to me. Arnoa said, Really? Larissa smirks and thought, Even she wouldn't outright defy the king. Arnoa in cold tone replied, I'm curious how he will punish me. Meanwhile Larissa gets hit by a stone and fell down and said, W. Wait, your majesty. Arnoa said, I'm no knight. I have no means to protect myself. I cannot hunt alone in the forest. Arnoa in cold tone countenance her words saying, But lucky for me, there's a beast right in front of me. Larissa in her mind thoughts, S.H. she is mad. She will hurt me just like she did at the tea party. The guards get confused and said, Please, your majesty, this just has gone too far. Arnoa giving cold looks said, Silence. Larissa starts crying. Arnoa holding the arrow said, I'm releasing the string. Larissa gets scared and holding her hair shouts, Aha. Arnoa shoots the arrow and it hits something at back. Larissa gets confused and said, Huh? What was that? The arrow hits Boar and kill him. The guard starts murmuring and one of them said, What in the world? Larissa was seeing that sitting on ground. Arnoa flipped her bow back and said to Larissa, Boars are bigger than rabbits, yes? Seeing this Larissa gets confused and shocked. She turns back to Arnoa and replied, Do you have any idea what you've just done? Unbelievable. Arnoa smiled and repiled, I believe. I've just won. She grabs Larissa from her face. Arnoa in a cold tone said, which means you owe me an apology. Larissa gets shocked and starts sweating and trembling, saying I, uh, uh. With tears in her eyes she said, I'm sorry your majest. Arnoa interrupts and asks her to stand and said, Lady Larissa. After their return to Palace Binas comes in Larissa's room and shouts, 
Larissa, who did this to you? Larissa sitting on her bed replied, Your Majesty. Binas holds her arms and asks, The Queen, what did she do? While Larissa was crying. Larissa holds him and replied, She threatened to shoot me with an arrow. Binas replied, What? Is that true? Larissa said, and on top of that, she laughed at me after I fell. Binas holding her gets furious and said, That foul woman. Binas in his thoughts said, She's didn't cause any trouble the last two years. What was gotten into her recently? The doctor interrupts and said, Uh, Binas asked her, Out with it. Is there something wrong with her? She writing something on paper replied, Not exactly, your majesty. She asked to Larissa, Lady Larissa, May I ask when the date of your last menstrual cycle was? Larissa replied, It's actually about two weeks late now, but why do you ask? The doctor asked, Have you experienced any recent physical irregularities? Larissa holding her head replied, I feel some nausea and dizziness, to be quite honest. The doctor shocked them saying, Congratulations, your majesty. Lady Larissa is pregnant. They both gets happy and Binas asked, What? Is that true? Is she really carrying my child? The doctor replied, Yes, absolute stability must be secured. Larissa got so happy and hugged Binas. She said, Did you hear that, your majesty? I'm pregnant with a child of Duranian blood. Binas in his thoughts said, That means, There is nothing wrong with my body. Larissa starts crying and said, I'm so very happy. Binas asked her, What's wrong? Larissa said, It's terrifying to think that I nearly lost our child because of the queen. Binas gets furious and said in his thoughts, She almost killed my baby. How dare she insult my appearance, threaten to hurt my family jewels, and try to harm this hard-earned child of mine. Binas squeezed Larissa's shoulder and said, She crossed the line. I must have her punished. Binas went to Arnoa's room. He enters her room and shouts, They are Arnoe. He pointing towards Arnoa said, I'm aware of all your malicious acts. You have taken advantage of my generosity for long enough. He said to his guards, Lock her up in a room immediately and do not let her out. The guards grab Arnoa and said, Yes, your majesty. Binus said, No one is to see her until I give my permission. He points his finger towards her and said while laughing madly, do not bring her a single meal or a sip of water. When she is on the verge of dying of hunger, she will have to beg me for mercy. The guards lock her in a room. The guards said to Binas, The door is locked, your majesty. He replied, Good. He turns towards the maid and said, Keep an eye on her and report anything she says. The maid replied, Yes, your majesty. Binas in his thoughts said, I can already see her begging me to sapra her after she's reduced to skin and bones. Meanwhile Arnoa sitting beside the door waits for them to leave. After they leave Arnoa said, he's gone. She tries to open the door and said, the door is locked. He must be planning to strave me. She rised and said, well, I'm not going to let him get his way easily. She starts to write something and said, first things first. Then she removed the necklace Belle gave her and asked her to not remove. In the next scene we are Noah eating a bread, she split the bread, and dipped it in a soup and then are Noah eat it. She flicked her fingers and said, all I asked for was just a little piece of bread. There was a lot of food including grilled chicken in front of her, she with a smile on her face said, you didn't have to prepare a whole feast. Then we saw Belle having lunch with her. Bell slice a piece of steak and then gives to Arnoa. He said, I can't have you strave to death. Arnoa in her thoughts said, I mean, I did blackmail him saying my soul stone would shrivel if I strave. Bell said to her, I even brought desserts. She gets the fork from his hand and said, I can't eat by myself. But isn't this a tab bit too much? Bell folding his arms stand beside her and said, I hear that woman like desserts more than main dishes. Arnoa eats that piece of steak and said, Are you interested in what women like? Bell gives a smile and said, I am now. While eating Arnoa said, One might say I'm pregnant one. Even Larissa wouldn't be eating this much. Bell said, I thought her pregnancy is fake. Arnoa explains him, It is. 
It's Dr. Ludes's handiwork. Bell said I didn't know she could even do that. Arnoa holding a knife replied, she's quite capable. Arnoa explains, from the disrupted menstrual cycle to the slight nausea and occasional fatigue. All I wanted was for her to lie that Larissa is pregnant. Arnoa with a smile on her face said, I didn't know she'd even make Larissa have the symptoms of a pregnancy. Thanks to her, Bynas will now have something that'll justify our divorce. Bell steps away and said, right, the door of this room will stay locked for some time, yes? Arnoa replied, it will. Bell opens the window and said, good. He won't be discovered then. Arnoa asked, he? Bell said, I'm expecting a guest. It doesn't concern you. Arnoa replied, how will that guest visit you when the door is locked? Bell said, he climbs quite well. Arnoa said, what do you mean he climbs suddenly she gets astonished and said, wait, that's... Seeing Luca in raccoon form she said, a raccoon. Arnoa rise from her chair and said, I remember him. She loves the raccoon and said, he's the raccoon from the hunting ground. Is he your student? Bell said to Luca, that's enough. Report. Luca transform in his original body and said, hi, your majesty. Luca shouts, wow. It's nice to see you in person. Bell hits on Luca's head and said, I believe you have news to deliver. Luca shouts, ow. Luca said, I did hear a few things from Kessman. Arnoa suddenly sasked, Kessman? That's the nation. She glares and said, at the northernmost end of the continent, where Grand Duke Asselier and his daughter are engaging in war. Arnoa asked Bell, why did you bring me news about Kessman? Bell huged a pillow and said, I thought you wanted to know about it. Bell said, you said the war must have something to do with the assassination. Arnoa thoughts, I'm surprised he remembered that. She leans towards Luca and asked, is the war coming to an end? Luca explains, nope, it's still very much ongoing. But it's not because Kessman is putting up a good fight. Arnoa with a concerned voice said, the Grand Duke is dragging out the war, huh? Luca said, how did you know that? Arnoa explains, it doesn't take a genius to know that the war is necessary to continue the flow of funds from the Empire to the Grand Duke. Things in the Empire are actually even messier than in Duran. Just look at how the Grand Duke killed off Luciano despite him supplying everything the Grand Duke asked for. Arnoa squint and asked, is there anything else? Luca replied, I heard that the Grand Duke formed a special force recently. She gets shocked hearing about Spicale Force and asked, A special force? Why so suddenly? Luca explains, The members of the special forces are practically sentenced to death. That's where the Grand Duke sends people he doesn't like to punish them. Arnoa asked Luca, Who are the members of the special force? Luca replied, Um, let's see. They are from all sorts of backgrounds and they never did anything to anger the Grand Duke. But they all have one thing in common. Arnoa asked, what's that? Arnoa gets shocked when Luca said, all twenty men are from Duran. Arnoa said, he must have heard about Arian's death. It's likely that the Grand Duke's plan was to kill Luciano and keep Arian alive. But now that he learned Arian is dead, he must be. Trying to break the spirit of Dihin's king who is the next in line to the throne. Lucas shrugged and said, and that was ten days ago. She said, are they already? Lucas said, oh yes. The special forces all died on a dangerous mission a few days ago. The Kesmanians must be furious with the empire to put their heads on spikes and put them on display. Kesman did the Grand Duke a favor by delivering a warning to Binas. Bell asked, why go through all that trouble? The Grand Duke could have killed the soldiers himself. Arnoa replied, that would have made him responsible for their deaths. This is one of the simplest power play strategies. The problem is Binas might be too stupid to understand even a simple warning like that. Actually didn't understand it and tried to bed Arnoa wearing a robe. Arnoa said, perhaps, she smiled and said, this might work in my favor. Bell hugs the pillow and also smiled. In the next scene, we saw Binas slam his hand on table. Binas in anger shouts, what did you just say? He said, ugh, that spiteful woman. 
How is she still not apologizing? It's been three days already. He trembles with anger, and the servant stands silent in front of him. The servant said her majesty didn't make any sound at all, so I had a maid ask how she was doing. The maid said, your majesty? Arnoa replied, totally fine, what? And all her majesty said was, I am fine. She even sounded more vigorous than three days ago Bina's listening to this slam his hand on table. Bina's puts his hand on her head and said, is she a witch or something? How can she remain haughty when she was locked away without food and water for three days? She looks like she would faint if she skipped a few meals. Perhaps it's merely an act of bravado. Bina's thoughts, yes, she must be acting tough to save face. Have that woman no shame. She would have apologized for her actions by now. I want to make her starve more, but what if? She dies? If the emperor founds out that I starved his sister to death. Thinking about that, Bina starts trembling and gets scared. He said, sigh, what to do? A servant intervenes and said, there's been a disaster, your majesty. He in an angry tone asked, what now? The servant replied, a message came from Kesman. Bina's asked, what's the message? The servant holding a letter said the special force that was established all got captured by the enemies and were executed. Listening to this, Bina's gets shocked and shouts, what? The servant bowed and said some of their heads were even put on spikes and displayed on the wall. Bynas starts shivering with anger and said, what? He gets nervous and said, what did I do to deserve this? Even though Arnoa turned me down that night, I managed to spread the rumor that we shared a bed. There should be no reason for Imperial Luciano to hate me. He holding his head thoughts, the families of the knights will want an explanation, and I can't ignore them because they are nobles. I didn't know the emperor cared about his sister this much. Having the esteemed imperial princess as my queen, and keeping Larissa as my lover was the feat to boast of. The servant starts sweating and said, Your Majesty, the lords are waiting in the audience room. Binas flickened and said, Already? He ordered his servant to free the queen. In his thoughts he said, I thought this marriage would benefit me, but it's holding me back instead. Meanwhile the lord shouts, This is preposterous, Your Majesty. Twenty men who were sent from Duran died meaninglessly deaths. The other lord said, How could the empire treat us this way? A lord in green dress said, Duran has always been a loyal servant to the empire. The lord in red dress said, What's gotten into the emperor? The lord in green dress said, We don't deserve such injustice. Binus sitting in front of them said, I, too, am perplexed by the emperor's actions. It turns out becoming a brother-in-law of the emperor was nothing but a shackle. Binus nibble and gets nervous. He said, but I am already married to Arnoa. I cannot take it back now. The lord in green dress suggests him a divorce. He was the Larissa's father, Count Estiae. He said a divorce should be considered an option. Binus asked, a divorce? Count Estiae replied, Yes, your majesty. He said the marital union with the queen is no longer beneficial to Duran. Binus said, One can't just divorce an imperial princess. His imperial majesty would count Estiae standing in front of him interrupts him, and said, I'm sure his imperial majesty could be reasoned with. If your majesty and the emperor come to an understanding, and if you persuade the emperor that the divorce is justified, it could be done and your majesty will no longer have to anger the emperor by punishing her majesty like you are doing now. The other lords listing this nods their heads. Binus said, but Duran is not able to pay back the dowry the queen brought to our marriage. It was a carriage filled with gold. What do we do about that? Count Estius said, I shall summon all the scholars within Duran to scrutinize the laws, your majesty. There must be a way no to give back the dowry. He glanced at the red-haired lord and said, In any case, our prime goal now is to protect your majesty and Larissa's child. The red-haired lord said, First, let us send a token of fealty to the empire to demonstrate your majesty's loyalty and appease the emperor. Then we shall seek a way to make the divorce possible. Binus said, I shall consider your counsel. Biting his nails, he thought, Yes, there must be a way. There's always a loophole. 
changing scenes we saw a garden, the servants said, wow, that is a beautiful dress Lady Larissa. Larissa was wearing a pink dress and she replied, haha, do you think so? Larissa's mother said, I told her to wear something that isn't a gift from the king when she's walking in gardens. But what do you know? All of her dresses are gifts from his majesty. The king loved her. Larissa in a very happy mood said, Mother, it's nothing to boast about. She said, His majesty only gave me ten dresses. The servants hearing this gets shocked and shouts, Wow! Oh many, so many! Larissa touching her red ruby necklace said, The dresses are nothing compared to this ruby necklace. The servants said, That's right, you also go to ruby necklace. His majesty such a romantic. It's so elegant and shiny. The last time his majesty even gave you a black diamond. His majesty really know how to make his lover happy. I want to be as loved as you are one day. Larissa listening to these words gets more happy and said, I have been awaiting this rush. I am loved by the king himself. Admire me, envy me. Meanwhile Arnoa comes and said, Larissa, she said, huh? Arnoa wearing a black dress comes in front of her. After seeing her, Larissa gets angry and said, Your Majesty. Seeing Arnoa, they all bowed and greets her. Greetings, Your Majesty. Why, Your Majesty? Arnoa remained silent and then said, I see someone has yet to greet me. Did the time you spent outside the palace make you forget the proper court etiquette? Listening to Arnoa's words, Larissa's mother got angry. She nod her head in anger and said, Your Majesty. Arnoa giving a smile said to her, How high your wrist? You hit yourself quite hard, did you not? She recalled the moment when Larissa's mother tries to punish her saying, But this time, hold steady. I will not play alone. Arg. Arnoa said to her, I never thought I would see you scream like a little girl. It must have hurt a lot. Meanwhile listening her words Larissa's mother got more angrier. Larissa's mother starts shaking with anger but manage it and said, Th thank you for your concern. In fact, I was concerned about your majesty as well. Her mother asked Arnoa about his locking up in room saying, Were you now? I heard your majesty was locked away after acting like an untamed horse. Three days without food or water must have taken a toll on your majesty. The girls strats glaring each other. Her mother said with a smile on her face. Although, it must have done wonders for your figure. Lord knows you needed to lose a few pounds. Meanwhile in her thoughts she said, How strange. Isn't she a bit too vibrant for someone who starved for three days? She smiled and played with her hairs and replied, The king would never do such a cruel thing to me. I have been doing quite well. Especially since Larissa apologized for her rude behavior toward me in the past. Larissa got shocked listening to this and shout, WH what? She said, I only apologize because you threatened to shoot me with an arrow. While I was pregnant, might I add? Arnoa playing with her hairs said, did I? Was only aiming at a boar. Larissa said, A are you saying I'm a boar? You sure squealed like one. Larissa steps forward and said, until now, I've shown you respect because I pitied your majesty's situation. Larissa standing in front of Arnoa said, But do not expect such courtesy any longer. I tire of seeing you. Move aside. Arnoa said you move aside. Larissa said I beg your pardon? Arnoa said to her, I was crossing bridge first and you came along later. Therefore you should move aside. Larissa in her thoughts said, She really doesn't know her place yet, does she? I am the king's first love and his beloved mistress. She smiled and thought, So she wants to dance, huh? Larissa said to Arnoa, Your majesty, you're familiar with the black diamond on my silver crown, are you not? She said, The king said such a precious jewel belongs on my head and gifted me the crown. A matching set with his majesty's. In addition, when I complimented His Majesty's wedding ring, His Majesty had it melted and made me these earrings I'm wearing. Arnoa replied, I remember. Larissa snicker and said, I'm His Majesty's lover, and you're not. 
There is nothing you can do to change that. She placing her hand under her chin said, Imperial lineage is noting compared to the king's love. Arnoa replied, Are you sure about that? Larissa tells her, His majesty even gifted me this ruby necklace today. Arnoa said I could not care less. Larissa said, Is it not beautiful? Larissa said, Anyway, I can take anything from your majesty, even though there is little to take from you since you are not blessed with his majesty's love. Suddenly Arnoa show her the mystic eye. Larissa seeing it said, What's that? Arnoa said, H.M., is this your first time seeing a mystic eye? Larissa gets jealous seeing it. She said in rude tone, I've e seen one before. Where did you get your hands on such a thing? Arnoa said, Larissa, there are things in this world that should not be pursued with greed. It's a virtue to know when to step back. Larissa said seeing that, you must have hidden it in a drawer or somewhere for two years. Meanwhile in her thoughts she said, I want it. Larissa shamelessly said to Arnoa, I'll move aside if you hand it over. Arnoa thoughts, you're worse than a boar. You're a bandit. Larissa said, I'll end up having it one way or another. So why don't you just give it to me? If you refuse, I might fall into the pond. Arnoa said, why should I care? Larissa replied, you do know I'm carrying the king's child, don't you? If something were to happen to me, his majesty would have to punish you. How are you harm Larissa? And what would people say? Punching the woman crying her husband's child into the pond. Isn't that what the villainous did in the burning palace? Your majesty wouldn't want to get divorced like the villains too, would you? I'd hate to make you the villainous who tried to kill me out of jealousy. Arnoa's eyes strat sparkling and she said, Larissa, you're a genius. Larissa proudly said, of course, if you want, I do. Arnoa reaches her and pushing her down said, I hope you know how T.O. swim. Never mind. I actually don't care. Larissa begged her to stop, huh? H. Hold on, your majesty. Arnoa pushed her in pool. She fell into the pool and shouts, ah, help. The girls and her mother shouts, oh my goodness. Larissa. Oh my. Lady Larissa. Guards. Come help her. Seeing this Arnoa gets happy and laugh at her. In the next scene we saw Larissa crying while sitting on her bed. She puts her face in pillow and shouts, A-A-G-H. Binus tries to calm her. He said, calm down, Larissa. She replied, how could I? She pushed me into the pond. Binus sighed and asked, did she really? Larissa said, are you doubting me? The mother of your majesty's child? Binus replied, oh of course not. He trying to calm her said, sorry it was just hard to believe. He hugs Larissa and said to her, oh Larissa, you have been through hell. She replied, I have. Luca interrupts them saying, actually, the pond is not nearly deep enough to drown. If she just stayed calm, she wouldn't have drunk so much of the pond water. Binas gets furious and shout while throwing a stone at Luca, get out, you useless windbag. He trembled with anger and said, No matter how busy the staff is due to the aftermatch of the Kessman incident, sending that imbecile as my errand boy is unacceptable. He turns back towards Larissa and said, Don't mind him, Larissa. I'm just grateful to the gods that you and our child are unharmed. Larissa said, What if it happens again? The queen tried to kill me many times, and she will try again. She holding his shoulders said, your majesty, why are you not divorcing her? Are her murder attempts not reason enough to get a divorced? Binas replied, there are a thousand reasons to divorce her. She enjoyed the company of other men right in front of me, and she even called her king hideous. However, even after consulting with all the legal experts, there was no solution. Forgive me, your majesty. Meanwhile, in his thoughts, he said, he was just talk. I'd have him whipped if he wasn't Larissa's father. Binus said I would have to return all of her dowry if I divorce her. But I already spent most of it. The gold that filled an entire carriage was used on new palace pillars, the gardens, and Larissa's dress and jewelry. 
He thoughts, come to think of it, the pawn Larissa fell into today was also made with that gold. Larissa mumbled and said, what if she left in some other way? Binas asked, what other way? Larissa smirks and said, like dying at the hands of people who have had enough of her malicious acts? Meanwhile Bell fighting with assassins said, I am sick and tired of Count Estia's lousy assassination attempts. He flicked his hand and said, Increasing the number of assassins fivefold won't change a thing, if they're all this sloppy. Arnoa sitting on bed said, He would rather send more assassins than divorce me? She sighed and said, I should have brought a smaller dowry. It's not like I had a say anyway. Luciano decided to offer Binas all the inheritance left to me by Empress Anastia as my dowry. She said, I don't care about the gold. Binas can keep it if he would just divorce me. But he must believe that if he doesn't return the dowry when he's divorcing the imperial princess, he won't be able to stay on the Emperor's good side. That must be why he wants to maintain the marriage. It's been 27 days since and heard of Luciano's passing from Bell. Binas will become the emperor if I don't get him to divorce me in three days. She bowed her head down and said, I wish I had more time. She said to Bell, I think you won the wager, Bell. Bell got surprised and turns his eyes towards her. She felt on the bed and said, Please polish my soul stone as prettily as possible. She said, Even if I had more time, he would just hear about Luciano's death from somewhere else. At least if I'd become a soul stone, I won't have to live as Binus' queen until I grow old and die. Belle remains silent, and she opened her eye to peek and see him why he is silent. She rolled towards his side and said, I thought you'd be more happy when you won. He replied, I'm not happy at all. Bell waves his hand in air and said, Why not? You said you wanted a soul stone. I also said things I want change often. Listening to Bell's words, she rise and said, What do you want now? He glares and said, I want to see you on the throne with a crown on your head. She gets confused and said, What? He turns his head and said, As the master of the enchanted tower, it would be shameful to become the messenger of an emperor even less capable than Luciano. He said, soul stones of occasions are rare, but it's not worth going through that kind of a disaster. Ahem, but wagers with non-sorcerers are just a pastime for me. I do not care if I win or lose. She said to him, you want to help me? Bell steps towards her and said, if I could. However, I still won't be able to harm him with magic. He touches her face and said, take his life or lie to him. Those are the rules until I announce the new emperor. He said to her, Do you think there's a way for me to help you? She with a smile on her face said, I can think of a few ways. Bell also smiled. In the next scene we saw Bell enters in Bina's room seeing him Bina's said, What was that? An assassin? Bell comes forward and said I am the messenger of the empire. Huh? Shocked Bina said, What is the messenger doing here? He blinked his eyes and said, oh. He starts laughing and said, did the emperor send you because of what happened with the queen? Binus said to Bell, tell the emperor that there is nothing to worry about. Even though her behavior is problematic, Duran will honor the marriage between our two kingdoms. I shall never make the queen return to the empire, rather divorcee. Ah, how noble am I? Meanwhile, Bell clenched his hand. Bell in anger thoughts, should I just break the contract and R.I.P. this man about? Then he remembered the words Arnoa said to him, imply that the dowry would not be an issue even if he divorces me. And Ludes will do the rest. Bell gets calmed down and said, that is not why I came. He folded his arms and said, here is what I came to tell you. The emperor will not oppose the divorce between the king and queen of Duran. Binas gets shocked and asked, is that true? He thought, he's here to discuss the terms of the divorce. Bell tell him, the esteem in which this kingdom holds empire has already been demonstrated by your behavior in the past. Binas replied, what about the dowry? Binas said, currently Duran is not able to give back all of the dowry. 
Bell said, the dowry offered by the Imperial Princess is but a trifle compared to the riches stored in the Imperial Treasury. It would be unwise to ruin diplomatic relations between our kingdoms over such a trivial matter. Bell inquired, am I understood? Binas replied, I understand. Bell leaving said, I shall leave the decision to you. And Bell disappears. After Bell leaves his room, Binas smirk and said, I can end it. I can part ways with that woman without suffering any consequences at all. Meanwhile, Larissa shouts from his room, What? You misdiagnosed? Lude replied, Yes, it's a common mistake. I'm afraid you are not pregnant. Larissa gets shocked and said no. Dr. Lude leaving to tell Binus said, This is important news. I shall tell His Majesty about this at once. Larissa grabs her hand and stops her. She said, Don't. If His Majesty finds out about this. My father spends so much of his fortune on hiring assassins that our household is one step away from being seized. If he finds out that thing I'm not pregnant, he will be even more reluctant to get the divorce. D.R. Lude sighed and said, All right, I will give you three days to prepare yourself. I cannot hold it off any longer, even if I am let go as a result. Larissa glares at her and said, I have three days. After that, things went as I expected. Thinking that he wouldn't have to return the dowry, Binus told Larissa about the messenger that visited him. And after seeing a chance, Larissa pressured him to get a divorce. The divorce process which originally should have taken at least 10 days, was shortened to a mere single day due to Larissa's relentless nagging. The story comes back to the day of divorce. Guest was murmuring. Arnoa enters in wearing a white dress and said, Look at all these people gathered here to become witnesses. This is the first time I have been treated with respect since I came to Duran. Binas picking the divorce papers see her and said you came. She bow in front of him and said, Your Majesty. Binus shout, Kneel, and asked her to kneel in front of him. She kneeled down in front of him without a word. Binus starts to open the divorce paper and said, Listen carefully. He throw that paper on Arnoa's head and said, I, King Binus Roche of the Durand Kingdom, solemnly decree the dissolution of our marriage. Listening this, Arnoa said in her mind, Finally, Binus said while she was sitting in front of her, Arnoa Saliard Cajun, you are hereby stripped of your title as Queen of Duran, and your presence is no longer welcome in this kingdom. Meanwhile she in her thoughts said, it's over. Binus said, you must now return to your home in the capital of empire. While she holds the papers and said, I finally achieved. She seems to be very happy and said the freedom I have been longing for. She bowed and said to Binus, we are divorced. I suppose there is no need to keep a false pretenses any longer. Binas gets confused and said, What? Arnoa with a smile on her face said, I have suffered enough for the past two years and I could not be more grateful to you for ending our marriage. Binas said, Does she fail to grasp what's happened to her? Arnoa replied, Unfortunately, it appears you are the one who fails to grasp what is happening, Binas. Binas thought, How can she be so arrogant now? He said to Arnoa, it seems the shock of the divorce has gotten to your head. But may I remind you Arnoa flicks her hair and interrupts Binus saying, Bell, come out and deliver the Emperor's message to the King of Duran. A blue aura appears in Binus and Larissa gets shocked and said, Where is the wind blowing from? What's happening? Bell appears from that aura sliding with wind. Binus seeing Bell gets shocked and asked, Huh? What is the Emperor's messenger doing here? Bell replied, Did you not hear the new empress call for me? Binus said, The new empress? Bell said, Now that Emperor Luciano and Emperor Prince Arian are dead, and you Binus Roche Duran, declared the dissolution of your marriage. The empire belongs to none other than Her Imperial Majesty Arnoa Saliard Cajun. Binus and Larissa both got shocked after listening this and felt down. Binus said, This can't be. Arnoa said with a smile on her face, Now, for my first order as the Empress. I am sure you recall that when I married you, I brought with me a carriage full of gold, as my dowry. Listening to this both Binas and Larissa get shocked and close their mouths. Arnoa with a smile on her face said to have it prepared at once. 
The story continues as Binus said, My queen, no, your imperial majesty, I'm on my knees begging you. He starts crying and said, Please stay in Duran for a little while longer. Arnoa said with a weird face, You sicken me. Binus said, Forgive me, your imperial majesty. Oh right. The feast I've prepared just for you. Arnoa thoughts, that was supposed to be a divorce ceremony. She thoughts, maybe I should hear him out. Binus said, I have gathered the finest chefs and dancers in Duran, he shouts, being her something. Anything. He said to Arnoa, as for the head chef, his family has been working for Duranian family for generations, she interrupts him saying, really? She said, I don't recall him cooking for me when I was a Duranian royal family member. Binus gets shocked hearing this and starts sweating. He said, that's... She said, you can keep your precious chef and his dishes. Arnoa asked him, so, are you going to marry Larissa now? Binus gets nervous and said, it's a misunderstanding, your imperial majesty. She said, oh? Binus starts mumbling and said, I thought the woman was pregnant with my child and as a man, I felt responsible, so... Arnoa thinks, ugh, his blabbering like an idiot. I should have just left. She said, you always had a great sense of responsibility toward your mistress. She said, if only you treated your queen the same way. Hearing this he gets shocked. He said, I was tricked. Binus shouts, Larissa and the court physician both lied to me about her pregnancy. He glanced and said, if it weren't for those two, our marriage would have flourished. He pointing his finger towards Larissa shouts, you. He shouts in anger, kneel before the empress. Arnoa seeing this thought, wow, how petty. He was acting like he would love her until the end of the world. But it didn't take him long to offer me his first love as a scapegoat. Larissa gets shocked and asks, your majesty, how could you? He grabs her arm and shout, you dare talk back to me? Binus said him angrily, shut up and kneel. Larissa kneeled down in front of Arnoa. Arnoa said, this is pathetic. Stop. Binus interrupts her saying, if it weren't for her, we would have become the couple of the century. He said, after seeing your imperial majesty, gazing into the eyes of the master of the enchanted tower. He starts crying and said, I realize that I have been in love with your imperial majesty. I was jealous because you imperial majesty, who was my wife at the time, was with another man. Arnoa gets angry hearing this and said, You must have gone mad. Binus trying to hold her hand said, Your Imperial Majesty, no, my beloved Arnoa Duran. He tries to kiss her hand and asked, Will you marry me once more? She pulls her hand back and said, No. Binus said, Give it some consideration, Your Imperial Majesty. You have no experience in ruling. He said, In this cutthroat world of politics, a naive soul like your imperial majesty will get tricked in the blink of an eye and lose everything. Arnoa asked, Ha! A naive soul, you say? She thoughts, Didn't he call me mad a few days ago? Binus said, On the other hand, I have been ruling as a king for years now. A veteran ruler like me can see right through people just by looking at their faces. I believe your imperial majesty needs a person like me. He said, if you could look past our differences and find generosity in your heart, she interrupts saying, do you take me for a fool? Arnoa said, you becoming the king of Duran is a tragedy, both for me and the people of Duran. She asked him, also for someone with such great insight, don't you think you left yourself be tricked too easily? He gets nervous and said, that's. Binus clenched his hand and said, that's because it didn't cross my mind that a court physician would lie to me. I have stripped her of her title for making fools out of both of us. Arnoa said, I'm glad you did. He gets happy hearing this. He asked, I did good, yes? Arnoa said, I'm taking Dr. Ludes to the Empire with me. His happiness suddenly gone and he asked nervously, I beg your pardon? She smiled and said, like you said, a naive soul like me could use the help of wise people. Arnoa standing from her chair said, If she tricked someone as insightful as you, she must be quite brilliant. Anyway, King Binas. She rise from her chair and said, Stop your blathering and bring me my dowry. 
Arnoa seeing a carriage said, I'm loving this king's carriage. She said while sitting inside that carriage, maybe it's because it's made with my dowry. She said, it was delightful to watch them fight. Bain is holding his father-in-law's shirt shouts, you. You have been trying to kill the empress. I'm confiscating your assets. She said, trying to make each other pay more. Even then, he couldn't pay me back in full, so he had to give up the king's garage as well. Binas asked, do you really have to take it from me? She said, you could pay me in gold. Binas said, please take it, I enjoy walking. Bell said, so you're sparing the count, huh? He asked, are you sure that's wise with everything he has done to you? Arnoa asked, why does it matter? He will bother me no more. Bell said, that's generous of you. She leaned towards him and said, I meant to ask. Will your duty be finished after you arrived at the Empire? Bell replied, I suppose so. The new Empress has been chosen. Arnoa said, Bell, don't go back to the Enchanted Tower. Join me in the capital. He gets shocked and asks, the capital? He said, why would I go to the capital? Meanwhile he thoughts, does she? Arnoa said, if you the Lord of Prahan and the Master of the Enchanted Tower are there, the nobles won't form a union and give me trouble. She said, people outside Prahan tend to shun sorcerers. But if you attend noble meeting as a lord, that might change. It's a win-win. Bell replied, it might be a win for you, but it's just bothersome to me. Arnoa said, I knew it. I won't twist your arm. Bell glares at her and said, You seem to know something of politics. Arnoa said, A little thanks to my mother, for an unknown reason. She said, Mother taught me many things, perhaps too many. Luciano considered me as a rival ever since mother taught me disciplines of kingship. Bell said, Anyway, I cannot stay in the capital. I must return to the tower. She asked, Is there something wrong with your domain? Suddenly she gets shocked and stops, she said, oh, oops. She recalls the moment when her mom said to her, Arnoa, even the emperor can't meddle with affairs that happened in the domains of sorcerers. Remember, the masters of the enchanted tower have a nasty temper. She gets nervous and think, I forgot what mother's teachings. After spending some time with Belle, Belle said, that's a dangerous question you're asking. He moves closer to Arnoa and said, Does this mean you're not afraid of me anymore? Arnoa said, I'm in danger. Suddenly Bell starts smiling and said, You were terrified of me when we first met. Arnoa said while smiling, Sorry, I see snowy when I see you now. Phew, he doesn't look angry. Bell said, Officially, my spirit form is a snow leopard. Even Anakin doesn't know what my spirit form is. She said, must sorcerers have a scary spirit form? When they're actually just a cat and a raccoon? Belle tells her, my mother's spirit form was a fire dragon. She gets shocked and said, a fire dragon? Belle replied, yes. That's how the masters of the enchanted tower are supposed to be. An invincible force no one can challenge. Arnoa thinks, so the great sorcerer Amaryllis was a dragon. Somehow. I think I understand why she wanted her son's spirit form to be a cat. She smiled and said, I must say, a cat is cuter. Bell asked, cute you say? Arnoa said, yes. It's warm when I hug it. Bell glare hearing this. Suddenly he transformed in a cat and said, meow. Arnoa gets shocked and said, hold on, Bell. You're not a real cat. You're a person. Bell comes closer to her and she touches him. Bell said meow. She thinks, he's provoking me because I called him cute. She sighed and said, I thought you hated it when I doted on your cat form. She hugs him and think, many warned me about the evil masters of Enchanted Tower, but no one warned me about getting seduced. By a ball of soft fur. Meanwhile in the manor Baron Vent said, I wonder if he will arrive today. It has been weeks since I heard of the Emperor's passing. Where is the new emperor? Duke Rickle asked, Have you heard any news from Duran? Marquis Duba replied, I should have but no. He said, It's been a month since Anakin Willow sent the messenger. But Duran is strangely quiet. I finished preparing early for nothing. 
Baron Vent asked. Did anyone else send a message to Duran? It's absurd they're staying so silent. When their king became the emperor. Countess Herman raised her hand and said, I did. She said, well, I tried to anyway. Baron Venn asked her, what do you mean? She replied, strangely, I couldn't even confirm if the message arrived at all. I'm still waiting for the reply. He asked, what was on your message? Marquis Dubert said, do you even have to ask? She must have sent her niece portrait. He said, a bold move, offering a mistress to the new emperor who didn't even arrive yet. She said, don't make a fuss. You must tame the emperor when he's still young and oblivious. Baron Vent folding his arms said, One might consider that a treason. If this emperor is dumb enough to fall for a honey trap, I'll just resign and return to my dominion. Marquis Dubert said, Broaden your sights. The new emperor is clueless. Someone has to take advantage of him. He said, I'm sure it's not just Countess Herman and I who are preparing to shower him with gold. He said, I already prepared the jewels to offer to the emperor. I even had the imperial palace decorated in Duran's colors so he can see it when he arrives. He said to her, good luck seducing him with a mistress. She starts laughing and said, the gold you generously offered will be used well by my niece who is going to the emperor's mistress. Marquis starts laughing hearing this and said, you don't know, do you? He tells, the new emperor, Duran's king already has a mistress whom his majesty loves dearly. Everyone knows about this love story in Duran. She said, hmm. A mistress, huh? She said in a cold tone, maybe I shall have her killed. Marquis said, things will get complicated if she gives birth to his child. Haha, that is not a bad idea. No matter what we bribe him with when Grand Duke Asselier returns, your new emperor will soon become a mere figurehead. They both gives evil smile and she said, then we better make the most of the situation before he returns. He said, I'm glad we see eye to eye on this. He said to Rickle, you must be over the moon Duke Rickle. He gets confused hearing this. He asked him, about what might I ask? Marquis said, your niece became the imperial queen. He said, isn't it nice that the forgotten imperial princess has become the imperial queen? Just like her mother? No one will lock her in a tower now. Rickle said, like you said, it's nice. But as long as Grand Duke Asselier pulls the strings, it's all meaningless. Meanwhile, the door opens and Arnoa enters and everyone gets shocked seeing her. She steps forward saying, I see I'm a little late. Marquis gets shocked and asks, who are you? He shouts, this is a closed meeting. We don't take guests. She said, we met a few times when I was young. Have you forgotten me, Marquis Dubert? Marquis asked, pardon me? Meanwhile, Rico gets shocked seeing her. Arnoa comes near the emperor's chair and touching it said, so you haven't heard? I see word travels slowly around here. She sits on the chair and they get shocked. Marquis said, huh? What are you? He shouts, how dare you? That seat is reserved for the emperor. Get off. She smiled and said, I am the new empress of the empire. Marquis shouts hearing this, nonsense. Duran's king is the new emperor. Arnoa said, oh that must be why the palace is overflowing with purple things. She picks the purple cushion and throw it on ground. Marquis gets panic and said, what are you doing? She waves her hand and said, I'm sick of purple things. Keep things like purple sapphires out of my sight, would you? Marquis gets furious and shouts, enough. Reveal who you are right now. Arnoa asked, not the smartest bunch, are you? She sighed and said, did I not just say that I'm the new empress? She said, Bell, perhaps they need to hear it from you. Bell steps forward. He stand in front of them and announce, I am Belcherius, the master of the enchanted tower and a lord of Perhen. I just returned after fulfilling my duty as the messenger of the empire. Marquis asked him, Belcherius, is she telling the truth? Bell replied, she is. The empire has a new ruler, and her name is Anoa Saliard Cajun. Hearing this all of them gets shocked. Bell said, all hail the empress. Baron asked, Arnoa? The imperial princess? 
I didn't recognize your imperial majesty. It's the first time I'm seeing you since you went to Duke Rickles Manor. Marquis said, hold on. To my knowledge, the marriage contract between Duran's king and your imperial majesty. Say that the king will receive the title of emperor. Why would your imperial highness become the empress? Did the king of Duran die or something? Arnoa said, he and I divorced a few days ago. That contract is now null and void. Hearing this Marquis and Countess gets shocked. Arnoa said, with Luciano and Arian under the ground. She smiled and said, I am the rightful heir to the throne. Arnoa said, I am still waiting for you to hail me. I am weary from the journey, so do make it quick. They all said, All hail the Empress? All hail the Empress. All hail the Empress. She thinks, It doesn't seem like I'm being welcomed. It doesn't surprise me. The nobles ignored me when I was young. Some even laughed as I, the imperial princess under the shadow of Luciano, got married off as if I was getting exiled from the empire. I didn't ask to be on the throne, but it's not that bad now that I'm on it. She noticing them shocked thought, what matters now is that I'm here as the new empress. After some time Arnoa and Belle were standing in a room and Anakin comes and opens the door. Anakin comes in and said with a smile on his face, Noah. Seeing him Arnoa gets happy and said, Anakin. They both hugged each other. Arnoa giggled and said, why did you have to write the letter like that? Anakin laughed and said, would it kill you to say you miss me first? I thought of you every day. Meanwhile Belle standing there hearing them gets irritated. Arnoa said, it was the worst way to say that I should become the empress. Anakin said, I was worried the messenger boy might open the letter before you. It was a sort of safety device. I trust you, but him? Meh. He touches her face and said, but you got the message and became the new ruler. And returned to me. Arnoa said, I did, didn't I? Meanwhile, Anakin hugs her. Arnoa said, let go of me. Anakin said, no, I haven't seen you in ages. Arnoa sighed, I know, it's just meanwhile Belle pulls her back. Belle gets furious and said, she said you should back off. Anakin said, long time no see, Belle. Do you also want to hug? Belle said, no, get the hell away from me. Arnoa standing between them asked, are you two really friends? Belle said, no. Anakin said, yes. Belle said in anger, I said I prefer being alone, but he latched on. Anakin said, I took pity on this friendless troll and hung out with him at the academy. Arnoa said, I can picture what happened. She stops them and said, okay, that's enough. Catch up on your own time. She said to Anakin, the more pressing matter at hand. Can you guess what it is, Anakin? Anakin kneeled in front of her and holding her hand said, just give me an order, your imperial majesty. Arnoa said, Anakin Willow. I appoint you as my official advisor. Bell asked, do you trust him? Arnoa replied, I do. He's an old friend. She said, talented individuals like Anakin are extremely rare in the empire. Anakin said, one might say the same of you. Your imperial majesty is truly one of a kind. Anakin kissed her hand and said, I swear allegiance to your imperial majesty only. Bell said, be careful. He griffed many people at the academy. Anakin said, me winning against you at checkers is not grifting. I won because I was good at it. And you were not. Bell said, did I tell you that he used to be a loan shark? People lost houses because of him. Anakin said, don't forget to mention that you used to absorb other people's mana and collect soul stones for fun. Arnoa stops them saying enough. I can see you both had a colorful life at the academy. She raised her hand and said to Bell, Bell, give me a moment to talk to him. Arnoa asked him, Anakin, how bad is the situation of the Empire? He replied, it's downright awful. While Luciano was sick in bed, the nobles took control of most of the real power. Thus, the nobles are unlikely to submit properly to the new Empress. Anakin said the ones who wield the most power Grand Duke Asselier and his daughter, Lady Roxanne Asselier, and they will come for you. 
Arnoa recalls the moment when she tries to defend Roxanne's horse. She said, she your sword. She said to Roxanne, this horse did its best and won second place. Roxanne pushed her and said, get out of my way. I have no use for a horse that gives me, Roxanne Asselier, second place. Saying this Roxanne hit her horse with her sword. Roxanne asked Arnoa, do you see how it's suffering in pain? She said, it's because you stopped me. Arnoa tells, Roxanne Asselier. Falling short of first place in a horse riding competition was reason enough for her to put her own horse down. She was much too cruel for a child of her age. He was just as bad as her father, who killed a soldier for not winning a spearmanship competition. Perhaps she was even worse. She kills people nowadays, just like her father. She still doesn't care for losing. Arnoa asked Anakin, then she should have returned victorious by now. Why is she camping in Kessman? Is there a reason for that? Anakin replied, Noah, don't act like you don't know why. Anakin said, there's no better excuse than a war to siphon the Empire's treasury. She's milking the war for all it's worth. Arnoa thinks, just as I thought. She said, Roxanne is like this sword of the Empire right now. The problem is that the sword keeps pointing the sharp end to its master. She must have been planning to make Arian the Emperor and play him like a fiddle. She will try to kill me when she hears the news. Anakin said, well, yes. She knows you are not her lapdog like Arian. All the more reason to clean the house before the Asselier arrive. She asked, how are the relationships among the nobles? Anakin said, as I said, downright awful. They despise and keep each other in check. They look down on the imperial family, but at the same time, they are desperate to make people from their families aides for the imperial family. She asked, you turned them against each other, didn't you? Anakin said, who else but little old me? Of course I did. He said, I did what I could to keep them from forming a union. But I'm afraid it won't be that way forever. When they start considering you as an enemy. It won't take long until they form an alliance, even if it's a temporary one. Arnoa said, so what you are saying is that I need to bring at least one person to my side before that, right? Arnoa said, then tell me. Which family is powerful enough to stand against the Grand Duke and is likely to stand by my side as well? Anakin said, there is only one family and you know it. Arnoa said, accept them. Anakin waving his hand said, there is no one else. She said, think harder. Anakin said, who do you think would be able to restrain the Grand Duke? Do you know of the North, besides Duke Rickle, the Sovereign of the South? Arnoa said, how about Baron Vent? Anakin replied, he's relatively loyal and strong, but his family is small. He wouldn't risk bringing his family to ruin for loyalty. Arnoa said, there's also Countess Herman. Anakin said, she detests losses. She wouldn't lift a finger unless she was sure she would benefit from aiding you. Arnoa gets confused and said ha. Huh. She thinks, would Duke Rickle agree to be on my side? She recalls the moment when guards were taking her to the tower, and she shouts, Uncle. You know me. I would never do such a thing. Uncle. Uncle. Arnoa said to Anakin, get me a meeting with him. She said, go tell him I'm on my way. Anakin bowed and said, as you wish. Anakin turns toward Bell and said, and aren't you done here? Go home. Bell said, so this is what you were worried about back in the carriage. Are you planning on making the Duke your ally? Arnoa replied, I have no other choice since you turned me down. Bell said, does that mean I'm your first choice? Arnoa said, if I said yes, would you stay? Bell rised and said, no. Like Anakin said, I'm done here. I'm going home. Arnoa said, it's a shame. I knew you would say that. Bell said, however. She gets shocked. Bell holds her hairs and said, I'm planning on returning soon. He smiled and said, the capital is more fun than I thought. Arnoa went to her uncle who was drinking tea. He gets shocked seeing her. He bowed and said, your imperial majesty. Arnoa said, it's been a while, Duke Rickle. Please have a seat. They both sits on a table and Arnoa said, consider what happened her uncle said in the past. 
she said forgiven. Her uncle said forgotten. Suddenly they both get shocked hearing each other. Her uncle said forgiven. I believe our family has never wronged you, your majesty. Arnoa shouts, are you saying handing me over to Luciano just because he asked didn't make you feel sorry for me at all? She said, three years ago, after Luciano's coronation, you served me up to him on a silver platter when he said he would interrogate me for plotting treason. I may not be a rickle, but I am your sister's daughter. She shouts, no one in his right mind would send off their niece to die just like that. Her uncle replied, it was the late emperor who forced ill fate upon you, not me, your imperial majesty. He said, I did my best at the time. She slammed her hand on table. She asked in a cold tone, your best? Did you just say you did your best? Her uncle replied, yes, I did. He said, I did my best to make your imperial majesty stay at my manor, as comfortable as possible. Arnoa thinks, during the time between Impress M. Nastia's death and Luciano's order to have me taken away, I live as a guest with my mother's relatives, Duke Rickle's family. It was clear that they never thought of me as their family. Everyone was always so polite and treated me like I was made of glass. They never expressed malice towards me or treated me poorly. It was me who had false hope. She thinks, I took out my anger on the wrong person. He is indeed not at fault. Ever for the Sovereign of the South, it would have been Diffie the Imperial's order. Not only that I was charged with treason. If Duke Rickle have protected me, House Rickle would have been changed with treason as well. She thinks, even so, I can't help but feel betrayed to some extent. Arnoa said, if you really aim to do your best, you could have at least told me where I was being taken to. Her uncle said, I couldn't the late emperor had forbidden me to. She said, I see. I understand. Arnoa cluelessly asked him, by the way, what did you mean by forgetting about the past? Hearing this her uncle gets shocked and asked, isn't it obvious? You have appointed Anakin Willow the most talented son of House Willow, as your advisor and took him away, being fully aware that House Willow is a vassal of House Rickle. Anakin said to him, when he was there to tell about the meeting, as the imperial advisor, I am here to request a meeting on behalf of the Empress. Hearing this he gets shocked. Her uncle starts shaking and said, I have been investing in House Willow for ages. If it had not been for your imperial majesty, Anakin would have become my advisor instead. He said, you of all people should be aware that House Rickle highly values talent. Your imperial majesty has taken the most valuable asset if my family and the greatest genius in the empire. She said, did you really think I would not resent you for it? Of course I know what House Rickle value the most. She thinks, my mother taught me that. Remember Noah. Wherever you go, seek just one person who has the greatest potential to be your aid. And give that person all of your trust and affection, so that they would even risk their live for you if so desired. She thinks, I took her words to heart and tried my best when choosing my aides. Dr. Ludes and Anakin are great example of that. She thinks, I can see why the Duke is mad. He's been investing in Anakin, and I just took him away. Her uncle picking the cup of tea said, that being said, she gets shocked. He said, I suppose it is my fault as well. I failed to make my house attractive enough for a genius like him, so I will put this behind me. She thinks, perhaps, neither of us is in a position to blame each other. She said, Duke Rickle. She said, I have a proposition. Changing scenes we saw Roxanne shouting, Damn it! Damn it to hell! The guards whispers in each other's ears, not a day goes by without that her breaking something. I was surprised she was agreed to the request of Kessman to halt the battle during the harvest season. I just hope she doesn't take it out in us. Her dad comes and said, Calm down, Roxanne. Roxanne replied, Calm down? She said, Do you seriously expect me to calm down when the throne was being usurped by a thief? She throws her sword in anger and said, Ha! Imperial Princess Arnoa as the Empress? What a sick joke! Her father said, Getting upset wouldn't change what happened. Roxanne said, Are you saying that I am just throwing tantrum? 
her father said, Of course not, my daughter I meant she interrupts him saying, It's been over a month since Luciano died. She steps towards him and said, House Asselier is supposed to be the real master of the continent. She gets furious and said, So tell me why it took us this long to find out who the next empress is? She said, What the hell happened? What caused the late coronation? Why was her divorce right before that? Her father said, It was not our fault. If anyone is to blame, it's that idiot, Duran's king. He apparently divorced an imperial princess to be with his mistress. Without knowing might have become the emperor. Roxanne said in anger, I refuse to believe that such a moron exits in this world. Her father said, Yes, it was hard to believe for me as well. He even had to return all of his former queen's dowry, including the jewelry of Empress Anastia. Roxanne asked her father, Who are we up against? Her father replied, You said it yourself, he is a moron. Roxanne said, I meant the Empress. Her father replied, Don't worry. She is painfully ordinary. Roxanne said to her father, Please elaborate. Her father said she was to the imperial family, but she couldn't even get education properly since her mother died early. She let a weakling Ike Luciano abuse her, and she even let that moron of Duran and his mistress walk all over her. The hardest thing she went through in her life is her divorce. Roxanne said she was basically a punching bag. The throne deserved better. Roxanne thinks, that's what became of Empress Anarsha's daughter? She thinks, wasn't she more alike? Her father interrupts her saying, in other words, she will make a better puppet than Arian. Roxanne said that let us send a warning. She steps on her sword and said, a warning more direct than what we sent to Duran's king. She gives the evil smile and said the Empress will kneel before House Asselier or die. In the next scene a man said, so the princess, no, the empress returned to the empire after getting a divorce? She did. Duran's king, who adores his mistress, declared our divorce with her imperial majesty soon after, the late emperor passed away. Marquis said he gave up the chance to have the entire continent for a mistress, huh? I must say, that was the most idiotic move in history. A man said, he must not have known. I heard he got sick from crying too much. Marquis said, I can't believe such a moron exists on the continent. He said, does that mean our new empress came to power because she got divorced? Someone said, she was the youngest among three siblings. She lost her mother early. She probably doesn't know much about politics. She would have to depend on us, the nobles, then. He said, I shall see if I can get one of my people to become her aide. Baron said, I don't know. She didn't seem that naive to me. The man said, you won't fool me. You say that, but I know you are just trying to beat me to it. Baron said, I'm not. Meanwhile, Arnoa enters and someone saw it. The Empress has come. They all bowed and said, your Imperial Majesty. Arnoa said, thank you for your warm welcome. Have a seat. They think so she is the new Empress. Actually, unlike the rumors, she doesn't look naive at all. Arnoa said, I am grateful to all of you who have been keeping the troubled empire together until now. Let us begin the meeting. I believe there is an issue about the valve with Kessman. Maquis thinks seeing her, she is jumping right at it. Marquis said, so suddenly, your imperial majesty? Arnoa asked, are you not prepared? You who reported it, was it not? Marquis said it was me, indeed. He thinks, I was planning to ease into it, but here we go. Marquis said currently, Grand Duke Asselier is engaged in fierce battles alongside the Grand Duchess against the Kingdom of Kesman. Not so long ago, there was even the tragedy of the Special Force, organized by the Grand Duke, being annihilated by the enemy. Arnoa said, ah, yes. The unit made of Duranians. He thinks, how does she know that? He said, and as you well know, funds are needed to overcome such adversities. She asked, did the Grand Duke request funds from the Empire again? According to the record, it's the third time this year. Marquis said, it has been a difficult war. She interrupts him saying, difficult, is it? Even with ten times more soldiers than Kessman? 
She said the Kesmanian army must be quite formidable. He thinks, did she just mock the Grand Duke? He said, Kesman has rugged terrain that allows the Kesmanian to have an advantage in battles. She sighed and said, to my knowledge, the military funds allocated for this year have all been depleted by the last request. How would the Empire raise funds on such short notice? Marquis said, oh, there is nothing to be worried about, your Imperial Majesty. He said, the funds requested by the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess are actually not as much as you might think. He even specified when and how to obtain the funds. He said your imperial majesty's dowry that was returned after your divorce would suffice. It was a carriage filled with gold and a pair of black diamonds, was it not? Arnoa thinks, wow. He wants me to hand over the dowry I got back in the name of military funds? The dowry someone brings to their marriage belongs only to them. No one can take it away as its private property. Even a husband must return it when he gets a divorce. Asking to hand that over means that he is blatantly asking for my obedience to him, the army commander of the empire. Marquis said, I know it must be offensive, your imperial majesty, but you must swallow your pride. Look at the bigger picture. Had the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess not defended the north, the empire might have already collapsed. There is no one who can replace the Grand Duke as the army commander. He said, if your imperial majesty knew the significance of this war, you would accept the grand duke's request. She thinks, the man sure has a silver tongue. She said, I understand. The late emperor did leave the war effort solely to the grand duke. Marquis laughed and said, exactly. You should show your gratitude to the grand duke. By offering him your private property as the military funds. She interrupts him saying, is there anyone who is against this idea? Marquis gets confused and said, Pardon? Against you say. She said, Would a peace treaty not be better than prolonging a war with an uncertain end? Nori said, Your imperial majesty must not know what the empire has gone through lately. She said, Sir Nori. Nori said, Although we are currently in a year-long stalemate, the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess have saved the empire from the crisis of collapse several times. She thinks, a crisis of collapse, he says? The Cajun Empire that practically spans the entire continent. Marquis said, he speaks truth the Grand Duke is the savior of the empire. Moreover, the fiancé of the Grand Duchess recently perished in a battle against the enemy, so there should also be compensation as consolation for her loss. He said, in fact, I'm not sure the return dowry alone is enough. Nore said, I agree. She thinks, so this is how they want to play it, huh? She said, I've heard enough. Marquis asked, should we go fetch the carriage? She said, no. She said, like you said, I still am clueless about the recent situation of the empire. Marquis asked, then why not just do as we advised? She replied, no. Let's put a pin in that for now. She said, I am not ignoring your advice. I understand what you want me to do very well. They get shocked hearing this. She said, and I need some time to think about it. They smirked and think, she'll do as we say in the end. There is no way she can defy the Grand Duke. All she can do is to reject a few times to save face. She said, as for this matter, I will decide what to do in the next meeting after giving it due consideration. She said to Anakin, you can write a letter to me if you have any opinions until then. Let us conclude the meeting. Anakin said to her while walking, Your Majesty, allow me to take you to the audience chamber. She turns and said, Let's go. She said to her uncle when she visited him, Duke Rickle, I have a proposition. He asked, A proposition? For me? She said, I know that Rickle never betrayed their own family. It's one of the things my mother taught me. She said, My mother was a Rickle, yet I carry Cajun's name. I understand that is why it is hard for you to accept me as a member of House Rickle. That must also be the reason why you are reluctant to stand by my side immediately. So I wish to propose something to you. Meanwhile a girl wearing a blue dress comes and said, Your Imperial Majesty. Penelope Rickle, at your service. Seeing her Arnoa said, It's good to see you again, Penelope. It's been three years. 
Arnoa said Penelope, but she remained silent. Arnoa said with a smile on her face, Penelope, didn't you miss me? Penelope starts crying and hugged her saying, Your Majesty. Arnoa tells, Penelope was the only one at Duke Rickles Manor who talked to me. She recalls the moment when Penelope giving her teddy to Arnoa said, Play with Penny, Noah. Arnoa replied, I am an imperial princess, you shall dress me as, your highness. Penelope said, Play with Penny, your highness. Arnoa said, I meant you should be more respectful. Penelope pulls her saying, Come on, your highness. Arnoa tells, Penelope only had two elder brothers. Maybe that's why she considered me as her sister and asked me to play with her relentlessly. She has still liked me even after she became a teenager. And when I was forcefully sent to the Imperial Palace. Meanwhile Penelope said I was thrilled when I heard your majesty asked for me. Arnoa replied with a smile on her face, it's so nice to see you again. Arnoa thinks she is like the sister I never had. I wouldn't have blamed you even if you changed your attitude towards me after so many years. But here you are, still giving me a warm welcome. I was right to call for you. Arnoa said, you can call me Noah when we are alone. Penelope replied, but my father told me that specifically not to do that. Arnoa said, you have grown up. Good, that's how lady-in-waiting should be. Penelope hesitate hearing this and said, a lady-in-waiting. Arnoa said, don't you want to be one? You are free to return if you don't. Penelope gets shocked and said, I do. I am happy to do your majesty's lady-in-waiting. Arnoa said, but... Penelope holding her hand said, I understand that your imperial majesty offered to make me serve you to form an alliance with House Rickle. But that's not enough for people to think the Rickles and the imperial family have a true alliance. It's too late. Your majesty seek other noble houses of power to form an alliance with. Arnoa thinks hearing this, Duke Rickle also pointed that out. She recalls the moment when she met Duke Rickle, he said, I see. Your majesty want to be a family with House Rickle. It's an honor that your imperial majesty wants Penelope as your lady-in-waiting, but I am afraid that it's not enough to call ourselves family. Arnoa said, then let me show you. Just how much trust one put in House Rickle. She thinks, also an alliance was not the sole purpose of my offer. She said, Penelope. She thinks, no lady-in-waiting other than her will worry about things such as whom I form an alliance with. Arnoa says, there's not a single noble woman I trust more than you. She said, you should focus on your own future rather than worry about such things. As a lady-in-waiting should. Arnoa turns and asks, is there anything you want for your future? Penelope asked, for my future? They sit on sofa and Arnoa asked, is it a marriage or a title you seek? A lady-in-waiting of the Empress can have it all. Penelope said, actually, I am interested in neither of those. Hearing this Arnoa gets shocked. Penelope said, I want to be at the center of high society. As the late Empress Anastia, who was called the treasure of the empire, once was. Her imperial majesty was famous for her tremendous power and wealth, but I have heard her with and charm were so impressive that they remain memorable even after her passing. It's said that her imperial majesty was able to prevent a war with just her eloquence. Penelope said, I want to be like her. Arnoa said, I think I can help you with that. Penelope, have you had a debutante ball yet? She replied, no, your majesty. Arnoa comes near to her and said, let me throw a glamorous, beautiful ball for you. Right here in the Imperial Palace. In the next scene we saw Penelope's debutante ball event. Everyone seeing Penelope gets shocked. Anakin said to Arnoa, The first event after your accession should have been for your coronation, not Lady Penelope's debutante ball. Are you sure this is the theme of the ball you want, Your Majesty? She replied, I am. The people have gathered. Haven't they? Anakin sighed and asked, A ball prepared for a lady-in-waiting? Who benefits from this? Arnoa seems to be happy, said, Follow the people's gaze. At this mind-blowingly lavish and overwhelmingly luxurious party, the debutante is commanding all the attention in the center of the hall. A lady from audience said, 
A debutante ball at the Imperial Palace? I am dying of jealousy. The other lady said, Lady Penelope's dress is absolutely fabulous, too. Meanwhile Arnoa drinking juice said to Anakin, Did you hear that? They think highly of Penelope. Hence, I am benefiting. And the finale hasn't even started he he. Anakin asked, Do you think this plan will work? Arnoa replied, I had your help with the plan. The chance of it filing is slim. Anakin asked, But if it fails? Arnoa lifting a cupcake replied, Well, she smiled and said, I shall still be giving my beloved cousin a gift. A man said, What a grand ball. I guess coming from House Rickle has its benefits. A lady in red dress said, I don't know. Her imperial majesty still doesn't have her people at the imperial palace. She said, my mother said this was just a means for the empress to demonstrate to people. How well she treats her only lady-in-waiting. The man said, maybe her imperial majesty is trying to get House Rickle to side with her completely. The lady said, that's a silly notion. The man asked, why is that a silly notion? She replied, it will take more than lavish ball or an expensive dress to persuade Duke Rickle. Her treasury is so full that even the cutlery at his manor is all made of gold. Duke Rickle wouldn't bat SNI even if she dressed, spoke, and behaved. Exactly like the late empress to evoke his memory. After all, she's not the late empress. If all she can offer to win the favor of the sovereign of the south is a mere fancy ball, then that's her limits as the former queen of the small realm of Duran. Ha ha. That is true. Meanwhile Arnoa opening a box said, Shall we begin? Anastia, the former head of House Rickle and the leader of high society. The Emperor Galilean Pelace Cajun, my father, gifted Anastia a pair of black diamonds when he asked her to be his second queen. Despite showing little interest in rubies as red as blood or emeralds as vivid as life. She was fond of black gems, and he knew just the thing to captivate her. A pair of black diamonds that sparkle, as if they held the depths of the night sea, and the luminous stars of the universe. You will become the treasure of the empire. I wish to give you the most beautiful thing in my possession. This incident became such a romantic tale, that it made black gems a trend across the entire empire. Arnoa comes in center of the hall and lifts her hand in air. She said, Penelope, my sister whom I adore, is the banquet to your liking? Penelope bowed and said, of course, your imperial majesty. You held it just for me. I will serve your majesty with all my heart as your lady-in-waiting. Arnoa said, raise your head, Penelope. She gets shocked and said, your majesty? Arnoa said, I held this banquet as your sister and not as the empress. So today... She said, I wish to see you happy as my sister, and not as my lady-in-waiting. Penelope gets happy hearing this and said, Thank you, you imperial majesty. Arnoa said, Penelope, I have prepared a gift to bless your future. She opens the box of a black gem necklace and said, You will become the treasure of the empire. I wish to give to you the most beautiful thing in my possession. Hearing this everyone gets shocked and starts whispering. A lady said, I remember that phrase. It was, a man said, that color, that size, it must be the late empress's. My goodness. A lady said, I thought her imperial majesty would wear it herself. Seeing this all, Duke Rickle gets emotional standing behind the crowd. Countess said, my, my, a bold move. She just gifted her cousin the reputation that was once carried by the late empress and the legacy of her mother. Even a real sister wouldn't be so generous. She said, Congratulations, Duke Rickle. Whether you want it or not, your daughter now inherited Empress Anastia's name. Arnoa said, joining Imperial family and House Rickle once more. Then let me show you. Just how much trust one put in House Rickle. As long as Penelope carries the name of The Treasure of the Empire, The Epitaph of Anastia, no one will separate the imperial family from House Rickle in their thoughts. The countess said, I thought the banquet was just a shallow plan to gain favor. For someone who was ignored even in a small kingdom, she sure made my remarkable move. Duke Rickle smiled and said, she's crafty. Just like. 
My sister used to be. Penelope said to Arnoa, I'm so happy, your majesty. Arnoa smiled and thought, with this, Penelope will now become the successor of Anastia Rickle with that kind of title. It will be much easier for her to rise to the top of high society. Arnoa asked her, have you picked your next dance partner yet? Penelope shaked her head and said, no, your majesty. Arnoa said, I see, Anakin dance with her. Will you? They both get shocked and Anakin said, why me? Huh. Arnoa said, don't you see men over there eager to be her next dance partner? If she dances with the wrong person when she's at the center of attention, people might mistake the partner for one of my people. We can't have that today, at least not now. They both said, as you wish, your majesty. Anakin gets closer to Arnoa and whisper, but promise me that your majesty will let me dance with you when I return. Arnoa smiled and said, if I must. Anakin and Penelope starts their dance. Arnoa said to Chamberlain, Lord Chamberlain. He replied, Yes, your imperial majesty. Arnoa said, I'm going to take a walk in the gardens. Let the musicians play whatever they want to. He said, Of course, your majesty. Arnoa comes outside and sits in garden. She said, Ha! Huh? My legs hurt from standing for too long. She thinks, Doesn't your majesty think it's a shame? She recalls a moment when she said to Anakin holding the black gem box, H.M.? What do you mean? Anakin replied, Your Majesty didn't have a debutante ball either. You had no one celebrates you. I wish the first event would honor Your Majesty. She thinks, The boat has sailed. There's no point in having regrets now. She said, Regrets will only hold me back. Huh. Meanwhile Belle comes in cat form and said, Meow. Seeing her, she said, oh. Arnoa hugs her and said, Snowy, you got cuter. Come here. Bell comes in his original form and said, would you stop hugging me already? Arnoa said, it was Snowy I was hugging, not you. Bell said, don't act so disappointed. She sighed and said, I thought you'd be at the Enchanted Tower. Bell said, I told you I'd return. Bell moves his hand forward. She gets confused and said, What are you doing? Belle said, Isn't dancing a thing at debutante balls? She starts laughing and said, Well, it's not my debutante ball. Belle holding her hand said, H.M. I don't care. He hugs her and said, I came to see the Empress. In the next scene, Belle comes back to his home using a portal. Seeing him, Luca said, Oh, you're back. Lucas said, I told you that you should come back early because the portal closes at midnight. It was this close to closing. Bell said, and I told you multiple times that you don't have to wash fruits grown with magic because they're clean. Lucas said, all food must be clean before eating. Bell said, I've never seen a sorcerer who's more affected by their spirit form than you, Luca. Lucas said, anyway, how was the ball? Bell replied, the ball was... He said, people were drinking and dancing on the other side, but in the gardens, it was like we were the only ones left on earth. The beautiful gardens and the sound of nature all faded away, and the only thing I could sense was Arnoa's presence. Bell said, enjoyable. Lucas said, I see you have put my teachings to use. It was worth it to sneak into the classroom in the Imperial Palace to teach you how to dance. Bell said, or you could have just paid the fee and learned dancing there in human form. Luca transformed in his body and said, I'm so proud. I knew it'd help. Bell said, you don't dance as well as I thought. Luca said, excuse me? Bell said, the Empress had a more upright posture. And she didn't wobble like you do. Hearing this he Luca gets shocked. Luca said, she grew up with Anakin Willow. The man has the most elegant footwork in the Empire. Bell thinks he does. Lucas said he danced so well, no sorcerers turned him down when he seduced them with his moves back in the Academy of Magic. Hadn't you heard? Of course she dances well. She grew up with him. Lucas said, well, I taught you well enough to dance with ease, didn't I? Bell said, it wasn't easy. Luca gets shocked and said it wasn't. It was fun, but so tiring as well. 
Bell glares at him and said, Why didn't you tell me that your heart beats faster when you dance? Luca asked, What are you talking about? Bell said, You should have given me a heads up if the exercise could strain my body. Luca said, How can dancing strain your body? Even poisons do nothing to your body. You were fine when you danced with me. Luca said, Maybe the body enchantment magic the dark lady cast on you has worn off. Bell said, Would you stop calling my mother? The dark lady. Luca said, I heard people called her that back in the day. Should I address her as? The cannibalistic dragon. Instead? Bell said, Just shut your mouth. Luca hesitated and said, Master, I was waiting for the right time to tell you this. But... The fifth child of House Leighton had a seizure again. Bell said, it's the fifth time this year. Luca said, will you give the same treatment as the last time? Bell replied, yes. I don't have a proper cure. The parents would want me to as well. Luca said, you said that there might be a cure. That a soul stone of a member of the imperial family might do the trick. Bell said, Luca. Luca said, the Empress is the only member of the Imperial family you have access to right now. Maybe you should try her again. Bell again said in anger, Luca. Luca said, she was willing to offer her soul stone for a wager. That means she's not too eager to live. If you could persuade her somehow to give up half of her life. Bell gets furious hearing him. Bell attacked him saying, I'm warning you, Luca. If you speak of the Empress in that manner ever again... I will flay your skin and make a rug for her. Bell asked, Do you understand? Luca said, I understand. I will never tell you to get the Empress's soul stone again. Bell leaves him and Luca said, I'm just a feeble raccoon, you mean it. Bell turns back and said, We're going to the Leightons. He said, I'll see if I can find a clue to the cure once I get there. Changing scene, Sanoa said, You are genius, Anakin. Anakin, helping her to remove her shoes, said, It was your majesty's idea to make Lady Penelope the successor of Anastia. Arnoa laying on bed said, It was you who said we should use the phrases my father said to my mother. It was also you who found out what the phrases were, and how to play it to the nobles. Arnoa asked, Did Duke Rickle leave me any messages before he left? He said, No, he left soon after the ball ended. He said, but I did encounter Lo Damien. She said, he's Penelope's eldest brother. The second son, Balan, must have been there too. Anakin said he said he was surprised, but he seemed to be proud of Lady Penelope. He asked me to convey his regards to your majesty. Arnoa said that must mean the duke was pleased. I'm done for today. Anakin said I'm afraid you have one more task. He leans on her and said, your majesty still owes me a dance. Arnoa said, sorry, I forgot after I went out to the gardens. He said, how could you? I was waiting for you while dancing with Lady Penelope against my will. He said, was dancing with Belle instead of me fun for you, your majesty? She said, he is a strange one. He showed up without being invited and left when I asked him to stay. He's like, he said, a cat? She gets shocked hearing this and thinks, does Anakin know Bell's real spirit form? Anakin said, his spirit form is a snow leopard, though. She said, yes, it is. She thinks he doesn't know. Good for Bell for hiding it. Anakin said, I advise you not to get involved too deeply with the master of the enchanted tower. He is unpredictable. You don't know what will trigger him to turn against your majesty and cause great harm. She thinks, I understand why Anakin is warning me. I've seen Bell kill people without even batting an eye many times. But every time he killed someone, he did it to protect me. It's true that he is whimsical. But Bell is. She said, I should prepare for tomorrow's meeting. She smiled and said, let's think of a way to show Marquis Dubert who holds the power. Anakin said, I've been waiting for you to say that. Arnoa attended the meeting with the Empress members. Marquis was standing at his place, screaming. This matter can't wait any longer. As I said at the last meeting, the war with Kessman needs more funds. He shook his hand towards his head and continued. Your Imperial Majesty gave away the most valuable thing from the returned Dowie, so we must find something else to fill the hole it left. He suggested. 
How about replacing it with the opal ring with Tian Tu once owned? Arno ignored him and asked. Any other suggestions? She turned to the other members and inquired. Is everyone in agreement with that? All were silent until Baron raised his hand. Baron Vent. He introduced himself and started. The war must end quickly for the sake of the Empire. Arnoa immediately agreed. I agree. What's your suggestion? Bell stood from his chair and added. Therefore, keeping the soldiers we have instead of recruiting more and actively attempting to achieve a peace treaty seems logical to me. Arnoa pondered. He doesn't seem to think he can make a difference since the Grand Duke has the nobles under his thumb. But it's clear that he's against the Grand Duke and Moist do it. So there's hope if he's brave enough to express his opinion. Marquis grew furious, slamming the table and screaming. How ignorant of you to say so! We already tried to make peace with Kessman, but they're all savages who can't be reasoned with. If word gets out that the capital hesitates to support the soldiers who are defending the North day and night, their morale will plummet. He added, The Grand Duke stated that the forces of Kessman are so mighty that if we don't press harder and continue to attack them, they might come to attack the capital. Meanwhile, Anakin arrived and handed some papers to Arnoa. Arnoa glanced at them and said, I don't understand. She appeared indifferent in this situation and continued, I thought we deployed an army to avoid that. According to the last three funds requests, the funds the late emperor sent alone were enough to build ten palaces in Kessman. Arnoa tossed the papers on the table. Marquis flustered and retorted, Your imperial majesty must not know because you only ascended to the throne recently, but in war, it's uncertain how much capital will be required to end the war quickly. We must grant the Grand Duke's request, and if another kingdom invades the empire, who will come back to defend the capital? Arnoa realized. This is the card the Grand Duke and the Marquis have been using to pressure the nobles and the imperial family. The reason why it's not easy for the nobles to decline their shameless demands is that gathering large armies and leading them is hard for the nobles to manage. It's been a while since House Rickle stepped away from politics, and the Grand Duke used this vacancy of power to force the nobles to obey him. He's been blackmailing them that he might withdraw at the most crucial moment and let the capital get attacked subtly but constantly. Luciano must have had no other choice than to keep supporting his war efforts since with a diminished army, there was no one else to defend the empire against other kingdoms. That's why the Grand Duke was able to drag out this stupid war for four years. Arnoa frowned at his sayings. He added, There were only a few occasions when the late emperor did not follow his opinion. Meanwhile, he's thinking, You're going to succumb in the end anyway. Just say yes already. Arnoa took a sigh and said, I'm aware of the late emperor's policies, but I'm the empress now, not him. She added, And according to you and the Grand Duke, it seems like all the soldiers who should be guarding the empire are in the north, leaving the empire so vulnerable that it could be invaded at any moment. Marquis was taken aback. Arnoa continued, If Kessman is that formidable, the Grand Duke should have requested reinforcement in case they do make it to the capital. Instead, he's been asking for more and more funds and done nothing with them to end the war. Maybe it's time we considered other options to resolve this matter. I'm open to suggestions. There was silence as no one spoke up. Duke Rico offered his suggestion, stating, Be it an army or a commander, if there is anything your imperial majesty requires, House Rickle will provide. I shall put my eldest son, Damon, in charge and send soldiers. Arnoa was elated. She smiled and thanked him, saying, You have no idea what a relief it is for me to hear your decision. Other members began whispering amongst themselves, expressing surprise at Duke Rick's unexpected offer. They noted, Oh, I didn't expect Duke Rickle, the Sovereign of the South, to step up to protect the capital. The Rickles seemed to no longer be merely bystanders in politics. They're clearly on the Imperial family side now. Wait, if House Rickle provides the army, what the Marquis has been saying loses its meaning. Marquis started shouting. And nonsense. Please reconsider, your Imperial Majesty. Arnoa calmly replied. Why would I reconsider? 
Marquis waved his hand frantically, insisting. Protecting the capital is a duty of great importance. You can't decide who will take on the duty. As soon as someone volunteers, Count Nori interjected loudly. Marquis Stuber is right. Even though Duke Rickle is your majesty's uncle, you cannot leave the security of the capital to one house. If the duke ever decides to overthrow, Duke Rickle interrupted, addressing Count Nori sternly. You're out of line, Count Nori, Marquis continued. I can't agree to this, your imperial majesty, unless someone promises to share the responsibility with the Rickles and keep them in check. Arnoa felt irritated by his demand, thinking to herself. He was fine with letting House Out Meller be the sole protector of the capital. Look at him contradicting himself as soon as things don't suit him. Despite this, she maintained her composure and added aloud. However, it's nothing I haven't anticipated. Suddenly, the main door opened, prompting Marquis to ask nervously. What is going on? Arnaud advised him. You might want to step away from the door. Marquis, taken aback, apologized. I beg your pardon. A cat appeared at the table, causing everyone to react with shock and confusion. Countess Hermann exclaimed. Eek, why is there a beast in the Imperial Palace? Baron added. How did it get in? Arnaud agreed. Look who's finally here, the man of the day. Bell appeared in his human form, twirling Arnaud's hair, and apologized. I'm sorry for being late. Excuse my bold entrance. People began to chatter, expressing surprise. Master Belarius, the master of the Enchanted Tower, came to the meeting. I've heard high-class sorcerers can morph into animals, but that was a beast. Bell placed his tail on his shoulder and addressed Arnoa. I overheard the conversation. So, you need someone to keep House Rickle in check? Yes, I'll do it. Marquis interrupted, shouting. Who hasn't cared about the Empire's affairs at all? And Perrin doesn't even have an army big enough to fight the Rickles. Bell inquired. An army? Why would I need that? Marquis astonished asked. Huh? What are you? Bell cracked his teeth and clarified. I am the army. Adding. By that, I mean I will come to your aid when you need me. Arnoa responded. It's great to have the powerful Lord of Perrin. Well then, now that the Marquises were resolved... I'm declining the Grand Duke and the Grand Duchess's request. Marquis seethed with anger. Arnoa continued with a smile. And I'm sure the Grand Duke's hands are full. Thus, I'm planning on sending a representative to negotiate with Kessman on the Imperial family's behalf. At the conclusion of the meeting, Arnoa declared her decision. I'm planning on sending a representative to negotiate with Kessman on the Imperial family's behalf. The Baron appeared surprised when Arnoa announced, I shall grant Baron Vent full authority over this negotiation. Upon hearing this, the Marquis began to voice his concerns. Are you saying you're replacing the person in charge of the war, your majesty? He then asked her, Why did you suggest entrusting Baron Vent with the negotiation? Arnoa replied, Because he is a man of principle who won't be swayed by the Grand Duke's words. She recalled her earlier conversation with Anakin as she sat on the sofa while Anakin poured tea nearby, filling the room with the sound of pouring tea. While serving her tea, Anakin mentioned, If we send him to the negotiation, he will likely produce results in less than a month. Herbal tea, your majesty? Arnoa accepted the cup and replied, Thank you. As she sipped her tea, she remarked, Good, I won't have to lift a finger then. You wish. Bringing those who went to the north back is just the beginning of cleaning up this mess. Anakin moved closer and explained. To proceed with the negotiation with Kessman by putting Baron Vent in charge, the support of Duke Rickle is absolutely necessary. There's no one else who possesses power comparable to the Grand Dukes. Arnoa sighed and added, Yet the Duke has hardly set foot in the Imperial Palace for almost a decade. The nobles of the Grand Duke's faction will use that against him. Anakin pointed out. As of now, it's likely that they'll say he might commit treason and argue that there should be someone who can keep him in check. Astonished, Tarno asked. Would they really make such an absurd claim? She then clinked her cup of tea as Anakin continued. 
Who could match the power of Duke Rickle, the Sovereign of the South? I might regret saying this, but the Lord of Penn. Meanwhile, the sound of Penelope's arrival could be heard. Arnoa and Anakin both became worried and rushed outside to see her. Arnoa inquired. What happened, Penelope? Lady Penelope? Penelope, holding a bucket, threw water on Belle, who stood drenched. Spotting Arnoa, Penelope exclaimed, Oh, your majesty! She then warned, Watch out, your majesty! This scoundrel was inside your bedchamber. Fluttering her arms, she urged, Call the guards! I will hold him off! Anakin and Arnoa exchanged shocked glances before bursting into laughter. Anakin commended her. Excellent job, Lady Penelope. As the advisor of the Empress, I sincerely appreciate your awareness. Belle enraged retorted, Shut up, Anakin. Arnoa clarified to Penelope, That scoundrel is my guest, Penelope. Belle, still drenched, stood calmly as Penelope apologized. Oh, my apologies. Belle reassured her, It's fine. Arnoa then addressed Belle. There is something I wish to consult you about, Bell. Bell shook his head as he sat on the sofa, removing the water. Arnoa offered him a towel and asked, Are you all right? He replied, I am annoyed, but I'll forgive her because she serves you. Bell began to rub the towel on his head as Arnoa questioned, What brings you here anyway? Bell immediately asked her, Aren't you happy to see me? He added, You seemed to be happy when I came to you in cat form. Arnoa replied with a smile. I am delighted. Oh, you must be the only one who can freely go in and out of the Imperial Palace. Bell leaned towards her and asked, What was the thing you wanted to talk about? Arnoa extended her hand towards him and said, I want you to attend the noble meeting tomorrow as the Lord of Pran and declare that you will keep Duke Rickle in check. She added, Other than the Grand Duke, the Lord of Pran is the only one in the Empire who can match the power of Duke Rickle. Of course, this is not an order. I'm asking you for a favor. I don't intend to force you. If you don't want to do it, I can always find another. Bell leaned closer and agreed. I'll do it. He grinned and added. However, I also have something to request of the Empress. Arnoa was surprised and asked. What is it? I didn't expect you to say yes. Bell continued. Allow me to join Baron Vent or something when he goes to the palace of Kessman. As he rubbed the towel on his head, Arnoa agreed. Sure, I'll allow it. But why do you wish to go to Kessman? Bell replied. There is someone I'm searching for. I can't tell you about the details, but I've finally come across the trail I've been pursuing for a very long time. Arnoa laid out the conditions. There are three conditions. Firstly, leave the negotiation with the King of Kessman to Baron Vent. You're just there to follow along. Secondly, you must help if Baron Vent requests it. Okay? She added with a smile. If he requests. Lastly, if I say I need you, you must come to the Imperial Palace immediately. I wish you a safe journey. Bell rose and began to leave, stating. I'm leaving. Arnoa bid him farewell to which he added, How could I not come if the Empress calls for me? Isn't there a law against that? He pondered, What a peculiar farewell, wishing me, the master of the enchanted tower, to be safe. Meanwhile, Baron Vent, though initially baffled by the recognition of his opinion, quickly accepted the command, viewing it as an opportunity to end an unnecessary war. Marquis Stuber, along with other nobles from the Grand Duke's faction, arrived to protest in the meeting room. Anakin informed Marquis, In matters concerning the Imperial family, a sorcerer becomes the messenger. Marquis was astonished and asked, What kind of law is that? Bell later discovered that Anakin dealt with that situation through legal and diplomatic means. A few days later, in the backyard of the palace, a dining table was adorned with food and fruits. Arnaud arrived while tossing a coin and said to Anakin, Thank you for your coin, Anakin. Anakin followed her and replied, I shall not go down so easily in the next round, your imperial majesty. You saw right through my poker face. Arnoa clenched the coin in her hand and remarked, I've known you since we were children. 
she switched her hand on the table and continued. Did you notice that Penelope really became the queen of high society? She has not reached the level of influence that Empress Anassa once held, but she has remarkably established close ties with many young nobles. It's quite remarkable. Arnoa then asked him, Do you think her age makes it difficult for her to build relationships with the older generation? Anakin replied, There is someone else who exerts influence over the older generation, Countess Herman. She has maintained her house for over 40 years and has been one of the most well-connected people in social circles since she was young. She was not only associated with powerful figures across the continent, but also held remarkable influence in the realm of entertainment and the arts. Arnoa then asked Anakin, You don't think she'll cut ties with Grand Duke Ashier, do you? He smiled and replied, It's hard to say after observing the alliance between Your Majesty and Duke Rickle, as well as the reaction of Marquis Dubert. She has already become more cautious, even though she is merely keeping her distance from the Grand Duke because she still wants to marry off her nephew to the Grand Duchess. Anakin whispered in her ear, This is a personal opinion, but her coughs seem to have gotten severe lately. Meanwhile, someone called out, Your Imperial Majesty, as Arnoa and Anakin conversed about Countess Herman. It was Countess Herman accompanied by a man. She was wearing a stylish blue dress. They both bowed before Arnoa and said, There were so many people around earlier, so it's only now I can properly greet your majesty. Countess Herman then introduced the man beside her. This is Marquis Bethaniel. He insisted on greeting your imperial majesty. Marquis Bethan began. It's an honor to meet your majesty, the newly crowned empress. I have traveled from my domain to meet you. Arnoa and Anakin were momentarily taken aback. Arnoa reminded herself, Marky Bethan, as he owns the most fertile lands in the East, his wealth is among the most notable of the Empire. I was already thinking of building a suitable friendship with him while Grand Duke Ashier is away. She pondered, But what prompted him to travel so far just to see me? Nobles with wealth and homes far away often exhibit a particular arrogance as they believe their taxes contribute significantly to the imperial treasury. But is the Marquis being arrogant toward me right now? She answered herself in the negative when she saw him sparkling with happiness. She thought to herself, Actually, it seems like he's trying to win my favor. The Marquis probably begged Countess Herman to introduce him to me. Marquis Bethan then expressed, your Majesty, if it's okay, I would like to invite you to the Bethan Manor in the capital. Arnoa and Anakin were both astonished. Arnoa thought, I'm not quite sure what he's after, but it might be a chance. She smiled and replied, Very well, I shall set the date. Marquis Bethaniel expressed his gratitude. I'm forever grateful, Your Majesty. Then I will take my leave. I'll be waiting for your letter. They departed from the scene and Arnoa turned to Anakin, asking, Was the Marquis always so friendly? Anakin replied, Not at all, your majesty. He's a scholar who immerses himself in history, so he's not inclined to engage with others. Some even call him the cold hermit of the East for always staying alone in his giant manor. Anakin speculated, Perhaps the spring that bloomed in his heart is responsible for his softened attitude. Arnoa inquired, Spring? Later, Arnoa arrived at his estate in a horse carriage wearing a black dress. She clicked her black heel as she observed the palace and uttered, The rumors about his wealth were true. Anakin, accompanying her, grabbed her hand and remarked, His manner surpasses Countess Hermann's in size and is said to be second only to Grand Duke Ashier. While heading inward, Arnoa commented, His manner is quite lavish too. Is it all to impress his lover? Anakin added, Who could blame him? She's his first love. A wind started blowing along with leaves, and Arnoa thought, The romance between a commoner from Beetle and Marquis Bethel, huh? The kingdom of Beetle became a vassal state of the empire five years ago. It was a small country that covered the coast and extended to several islands. Although it was small, it was populated by a large number of people. However, due to false rumors, Citizens of Beetle have not fully integrated into the Empire even five years later. The rainstorms have gotten more frequent since they joined the Empire. 
There were rumors like people from Beetle worship a strange god and are capable of cursing those they hate. Although all the stories about them were false, the rumors were given credence by their unique appearance characterized by pale skin and water-like hair color, and they will pull you under the water to die if you go swimming with them. That seemed to prove the legend claiming they are descendants of the god of the sea. Their unmistakable appearance and their habits from living by the seaside appeared alien to the citizens of the empire, leading to their ostracism. Arnaud added, If Marquis Dubert hadn't spread damaging rumors about Beetle as a way to exalt Grand Duke Achier's military merit, perhaps they wouldn't have been shunned to such an extent. Arnaud was deep in thought when someone called her. Your Majesty. It was the Marquis rushing towards her. His servant called after him. Marquis Bethan. But he didn't listen. The Marquis began. Your Majesty's gracing of my modest estate is truly an honor. Please follow me. Arnoa observed his beautiful palace and thought. Modest? Nothing here exactly says modest. She sat at the dining table along with the Marquis, picking up a cupcake and examining it. The Marquis welcomed Arnoa, saying, Have a seat, Imperial Advisor. Even though there's not much, please help yourself and enjoy. Arnoa replied graciously, I shall remember your kindness. The Marquis apologized. My apologies, Your Majesty, but would it be permissible for one of my acquaintances to join us? Arnoa granted permission, stating, Permission granted. The Marquis became happy, expressing, Thank you, Your Majesty. Meanwhile, a girl arrived wearing a blue and white royal dress with blue hair. My name is Vieta. She bowed before Arnoa. Arnoa replied, Have a seat. And Vieta sat down, saying, Thank you, Your Majesty. The Marquis leaned towards her, taking a sigh before speaking. The reason why I have invited Your Majesty is because I have a humble request to make. Lady Penelope's debutante ball was very impressive. Holding it at the Imperial Palace truly made it memorable. Arnoa added graciously, Thank you. It was the debutante who made it so special. While holding Vieta's hand, the Marquis continued, so, um, since the old days, it has been said that a true man makes the woman by his side happy, like Lupian I, who only loved one woman, even though it was acceptable for him to have many wives at the time. He added nervously, I wish to organize a glamorous debutante ball for Vieta like you did for Lady Penelope. Please grant me this wish, Your Majesty. Arnoa clinked her tea and replied firmly, in the past, there were nobles who paid for using the imperial palace to throw debutante balls for their daughters. However, I don't intend to allow such liberties. Penelope was able to have her debutante ball at the imperial palace because she's my family. I understand your desire to give your lover a chance to socialize with the nobles, but I cannot grant such privileges to just anyone upon request. Arnoa stated firmly, and the Marquis' expression shifted to unhappiness. He began to speak, but before he could, Vieta gently grasped his hand and interjected. Listen to her, Imperial Majesty. The fact that I've met you alone is more than enough to make me happy. I mean it, I'm fine. Vieta assured the Marquis, who was now tearful. He squeezed her hand tightly and turned to address Arnoa, saying, You don't need to do all that for me, Your Majesty. Please allow me to tell you my story. If you still decline after hearing it, I shall never request it again. Arnoa considered for a moment before replying. All right, go on. And with that permission granted, the Marquis began recounting his tale, starting with. It was last summer. Marquis began by informing Arnoa about Vieta. As you're aware, Beetle met its demise around five years ago and was subjugated under the Empire by order of the Empire's Commander-in-Chief. All the citizens of Beetle migrated to the heartlands of the Empire. I sought to research the history of Beetle and acquired a seaside villa to reside there for a while. One day, while I was aboard a ship enjoying the sea breeze, someone covertly set fire to the back of the ship and fled. Just when I thought I was done for, Vieta, who was on board to help with the voyage, saved me from the flames. She jumped into the sea and swam for an hour, all while holding me. I fell in love with her after she saved my life while risking hers. So, I asked her to be my lover. 
Marquis embraced her tenderly and said, And my sweet Vieta was kind enough to have me. Vieta responded, You were cute. Marquis gazed at Vieta and continued, However, a problem arose after that. Rumors began to spread that a mermaid descended from the devil as seducing me to take over my house. Upon hearing this, Arnoa was astonished and exclaimed, Did people actually believe in such nonsense? Anakin chimed in. It was a rather specific rumor, your majesty. The neck of the mermaid is branded with the mark of the devil. There are people who witnessed the marquee being dragged into the sea and so on. He added with a somber tone. Marquis said, It turned out the rumors originated from one of my vassals who wanted their daughter to marry me. I had them beheaded according to the imperial law, but the rumors of my alleged devil worship continued to escalate. He looked at her while saying, Bieta has a permanent burn on her body, but we're keeping it a secret because we don't want to give the rumors any more fuel. Violetta nodded her head, revealing her burn as she moved her hair aside. Marquis clenched his hand in anger on the table, asserting, She got this scar from saving my life, and I will not sit and watch while people gossip about it. Arnoa interjected, stating, So you wanted a debutante ball at the Imperial Palace as a way to elevate Vieta's name in society while suppressing the rumors about her? With a sniffle, Marquis agreed. That's right, your majesty. He continued, After seeing Lady Penelope's debut grab everyone's attention, I thought that if Vieta established her position in high society like that, the folks of my dominion might cease to believe such rumors and come to admire Vieta for her beauty and her affectionate nature. Marquis broke into tears as he expressed this. Arnoa reassured him. A debutante ball at the Imperial Palace is not the answer to your problem. Marquis sighed and replied, I know, your majesty. I'm sorry for asking. Arnoa added with a smile. I meant you don't have to break the rules and the tradition of the Empire when there is a much better solution. Meanwhile, in a bar, a boy sat on the floor visibly scared while his boss scolded him. You absolute donkey! How are you even incapable of washing the dishes? Do you know how many beer glasses you broke? The boy replied. I'm sorry, I have never worked at a tavern before. His boss with a shaved head yelled. Is that right, princess? You're about as useful as a waterproof tea bag. You got fired from the theater because you couldn't memorize your lines, didn't you? You can't even take orders, right? The boy pleaded. I'm truly sorry. If you could just give me one more chance. His boss, hitting him on the floor, retorted. I am done giving you chances. You're fired. After being fired, the boy moved while sobbing and crying to himself. I was once a renowned actor in Duran, but now I'm just a nobody. After I got exiled from Duran, I became a laughing stock in the Empire. He remembered his audition at the Imperial Theater where he stood on stage and introduced himself, saying, It's an honor to meet you. I'm L.S. Edward Balonis Leonardo Abigail Dillon. I was once a renowned actor in Duran. The manager scolded him. What kind of name is that? We're not hiring comedians. Get out of here. Once more, he began crying while thinking. Is Duran even a real kingdom? An idiot who changed his name into every name he thought was cool. As he walked, someone called out to him, and he turned back, thinking. What did I do to deserve this? Huh, the person in the black outfit asked him. Are you Rictavian? He hesitantly replied. Ah, uh, well, yes. Before falling down, someone else said, Is it him? Rick flinched and started begging. W.H., what do you want with me? I swear I didn't do anything. Please spare my life. The person asked him. Do you recognize me? Rick, astonished, stammered. Hmm, pardon me. When the person revealed herself to be Arnoa by slipping the cloth from her face, Rick recognized her and exclaimed. You're the queen of Duran. Arnoa drew her weapon, and he quickly corrected himself. And no, the empress of the empire. Anakin whispered in Arnoa's ear. He seems a bit dull. Are you sure he's the right person for the job? She sighed and replied. Believe it or not, he's not a complete idiot. Arnoa then asked him. Do you know why I brought you here, Rictavian? 
Would you like to be on the stage again as the main character? The next day, Arnoa and Anakin observed the rehearsal in the theater room. Arnoa complimented. The rehearsal is going well. Anakin replied. I'm glad you approve, your majesty. The practice has been going smooth. Frankly, I was worried when your majesty told me that I can beat him until he could act properly. But he's been practicing day and night, all by himself. It seems like my advice worked like a charm. Arnoa added. You're there to take all the blame. It's your fault if other actors fail to act. It's your fault if the crowd isn't convinced. Anakin responded. You're in charge now. Your acting is too much, by the way. Study acting more before you teach someone else. But you'll get fired if you upset other actors with literal fire. You will be burned. Meanwhile, Marquis and Vieta arrived. Marquis expressed. I can't even begin to describe how much I appreciate this, your majesty. Arnoa asked him. Did you like the rehearsal, Marquis? He seemed happy and said. Like is an understatement. Vieta chimed in. Once this play ends, the perception of the people toward Beetle surely will change. Arnoa shrugged and remarked. We still have half a month left until the premiere. With excitement, Vieta added. Even without a proper stage set, it was amazing. And Laura is an old friend of mine. My heart filled with joy when I saw her act again. Marquis interjected. I know that, your majesty, you assisted in this matter not just for us but for the people of Beetle. What benefits them benefits Vieta, and she is the most important person to me. He continued, looking at Arnoa. If I can quiet the disturbing rumors about Vieta and the people of Beetle, and if it enables her to live with dignity in the Empire, I would gladly give up everything. Arnoa paused and asked. Everything? He said I will terminate all the contracts with the Grand Duke and start conducting business with the individual designated by. Your Majesty. Arnoa said, wait, I know that you have many ties with the Grand Duke. You don't need to sever them all on my account. She thinks, ID was one of my goals when I started building a friendship with him, but I didn't change sides this easily. He said, your majesty, I'm a simple man. He said, as I said, I'm willing to give up everything for my dear Violetta. Arnoa said, you will suffer a great loss from this. He replied, I am willing to suffer if it is for the sake of Violetta. I'll be looking forward to the opening night, your majesty. Arnoa thinks it's likely that he heard from Countess. Herman that the Grand Duke and I are in conflict. Anyway, gaining the support of Marquis Bethaniel is a great achievement. Meanwhile, the director of the play said I'd also like to thank you, your majesty, for giving me a chance to direct this wonderful play. This scenario is so well written that I would have directed it even if I had to pay for it myself. Arnoa said, I'm the one WHO's thankful. Hiring a Bidelian as an actress must have been a hard decision. The director said, her nationality doesn't matter as long as she acts. The theater company, The Wolves of the Stage, is famous for their bold casting choices, including former criminals, noble families and even those who were forsaken by their families. I was right to. Arnoa asked, Do you have any complaints about the actors? He said, As I said earlier, Rick is pulling his weight. As for Laura. Arnoa asked, Is anyone harassing her? He said, Oh, because she's from Beetle? You're welcome. To take a look for yourself. Laura practicing the act said, Who are you? Are you a human? What do you seek from my sea? Rick said to him. I don't think your voice should be trembling in this scene. She asked, was my voice trembling? Rick said, could you? Maybe try it just once more, please. With a little more confidence. She said, relax, Rick. Of course I can do it again. You don't have to be so tense when you talk to me. You're a great teacher. I'm not going to bite you or something. Two ladies seeing this said, Hey, Rick, grow some balls and speak normally for Pete's sake. Can't you see you're making her uncomfortable? Rick asked Laura, Am I making you uncomfortable, Laura? The director said to Arnoa, 
He's been acting like a scared puppy in front of Laura since day one. Laura and the other actors bonded, making fun of him together. He said there's nothing like making fun of someone for bringing everyone together. Sure, Rick is a bit of a show OFF, but I respect him for his passion for the arts. Arnoa laughed and said I see he's doing well. The director said, just wait until you see the set. It will blow your majesty's mind. Arnoa said I heard you. We're having trouble making sets for the ocean. Have you? Found a solution for that? He replied, an anonymous patron has donated something exceptional to help with that. They must have recognized my talent like your majesty. And all the problems were solved. Arnoa thinks, an anonymous patron, huh? The set the director wants can't be achieved with technology and money alone. She said they must have donated an artifact. He replied, not just any artifact. He said, it's nothing like light orbs or accessories you can get from the black market. Arnoa said, keep your voice down, will you? Black market trade is illegal. He said, the artifact is so intricate. I can't even understand how it works. It is a masterpiece, to say the least. Arnoa thinks there's only one person who has that kind of high-level technology and artifacts in his disposal. She laughed and think, how did he find out that I'm preparing a play? I shall get myself prepared to be surprised. Meanwhile, a lady with Penelope asked, did you hear about the new play being put on by the wolves of the stage? She said, the empress herself seems to have sponsored the play. I can't wait to see it. Penelope said the play is held at the famed Ferryden Theatre in the heart of the capital, so I already reserved two tickets for the best center seats. The boy said I have my doubts about the play. How can I be sure it's worth watching if they don't disclose the story? Penelope said I heard that the first show is already sold out. You missed your chance by overthinking. He asked, as sold out you say? She replied, I'm afraid so. But do not worry. I'll tell you all about it when I get back from the show. He said, I hear it's just another love story. I think that kind of play is for commoners. I am not missing much. He said, real art makes you contemplate life and death, good and evil, and human nature. She asked, how could you criticize the play without even watching it? She smirks and said, can that truly be considered the right attitude toward appreciating art? She said, have some faith in the Empress. Keeping the garden tea room open for young nobles. Taking charge of the war with Kesman. Since the day Her Majesty returned to the capital, she's been achieving accomplishments left and right that were considered impossible before. Meanwhile seeing the play nobles said, she's right. Also, that handsome stickler advisor can't stay away from her. Majesty. Even that prickly master of the enchanted tower seems to listen to her majesty. The new empress sure has a lot of men around her. The capital has never been more exciting. She is one hell of a pot stirrer. Arnoa heard. Everything. Anakin said the young nobles sure love to gossip. Arnoa said there are worse things to have than scandals with handsome men, I suppose. She glanced at someone and said, by the way, where is Countess Herman? I wanted to talk to her. Anakin said she used to practically live in the Imperial Palace, but nowadays it's hard to find her around here. Arnoa said I heard she gradually stopped coming to the palace after the meeting about the war with Kesman. Anakin said she must be cautious because of Grand Duke Asselier, which was expected. He said, but I didn't expect her to stop coming altogether before the play even started. No matter how powerful a person may be, usually, after a few years away from the capital, people tend to forget their influence. But it seems like Countess Herman is too cautious to forget. She's playing the long game. Although the play is already quite successful, if rumors circulate that Countess Herman who is at the center of society is not attending, IT could affect its reputation. Arnoa thinks, well, I suppose I can have everything I want. She raised from her chair thinking, Countess Herman isn't the only one who I want to invite to the play. Anakin asked her, are you going somewhere? Arnoa said, there's someone I need to see. 
Anakin said, allow me to accompany you. But Arnoa said, no, I'm going alone. Wrap up the tea party for me. Arnoa leaves and Anakin said, oh, I see. I'll see you when you get back, your majesty. Meanwhile, Arnoa asked, W what? What do you mean? She gets shocked while asking, she will die soon? Arnoa went to Dr. Ludes and said, Good afternoon, Dr. Ludes. Seeing Arnoa, Dr. Ludes said, Oh, your majesty. Dr. Ludes bowed and said, I meant, your imperial majesty. Arnoa said, You are unmatched in medicine in the empire, but you are terrible at court etiquette. Dr. Ludes said, I am very grateful to your... I mean, thank you. Please have a seat. Arnoa said, It's been a while. Do you like the laboratory of the empire? Dr. Ludes replied, Yes, your majesty. It's far better than the one in Duran. Giving tea to Arnoa, she said, This tea is brewed with medicine herbs, but it'll be good for your health. Give it a try. Arnoa said, said that I admire your passion for research, but sometimes you need to go out and get some fresh air. Do you like plays? Dr. Ludes gets shocked and repeated her words. Plays? Arnoa laughed and said that there's a play I have been working on lately. I'd be glad if you could come watch it. Dr. Ludes replied, I couldn't miss it for the world. Arnoa said, it's a great play, also a good chance to see what nobles look like in the empire because most of them will be there. Dr. Ludes asked, most of the nobles, you say? She asked, will she be there too? Arnoa asked, who do you mean? Dr. Ludes said, the countess who tries to set me up with her distant relative. Arnoa said, for a date? Do you mean Countess Herman? Did she approach you? Dr. Ludes said, oh right. She probably wouldn't be able to make it to the play, will she? Arnoa said, Countess Herman's attendance hasn't been decided yet. How do you know that she wouldn't make it? Have you heard something about her? Dr. Ludes replied, no, it's what I saw. Arnoa asked, what did you see? Dr. Ludes replied, by the look of her, I am certain that. She will die soon. Arnoa became affaired and said, what? What do you mean? She will die soon. A servant bowed and said to Arnoa, Your Imperial Majesty. Welcome to the castle of Countess Herman. Arnoa said, Lead me to her. Penelope asked, How come there's only one maid greeting Her Majesty? The maid said, I am truly sorry for not welcoming Her Majesty more adequately. Currently everyone, including the viscouses in the Countess chambers which unfortunately prevented them from greeting Her Majesty themselves. Arnoa thinks, this is certainly not a common occurrence usually at least one family member comes out in greeting when the Empress visits. The maid opens the door saying, this is her chamber, your majesty. They enters and gets confused while hearing Countess Herman's daughter saying, how could you tell me greet a guest in a time like this, mother? Her son said, don't you have duties at the acting head of the family, sister? I'll take care of mother. Her granddaughter said, I am grandma's favorite. I should be the aunt who feeds her. A man said that let's all stay here for now. Wouldn't that make our aunt feel more at home? The girl next to him said, No, I shall stay by her side. You should all leave. The man asked, Don't you have work to do? Countess Herman shouts in anger, Silence. I am trying to rest here. She shouts, You are all imbeciles who can't even periodize your tasks at hands. She starts coughing and asked, would someone please greet the Empress? Her daughter tries to say, but Countess Herman interrupts her saying, Don't you talk back to me. Arnoa comes and said, Countess Herman. Seeing her they get surprised and said, Your Majesty? Her daughter bowed and said, Your Imperial Majesty. Arnoa said, It's fine. Stay in the bed, Countess Herman. Countess Herman said, Thank you, Your Majesty. Everyone, leave. Her Majesty and I have a matter to discuss. Her daughter said, but... Countess Herman glares at them and they rush towards the door saying, We're leaving, we're leaving. She coughed and then said, Please forgive the foolishness of my family, Your Majesty. Arnoa said, Deep affection among family members is a good thing. Arnoa said, You bicker and argue, but the bond seems strong between you and your family. I'm jealous. Countess Herman said, They're fools but they're my family. 
They mean everything to me. Anoa said, you don't look so well. Countess Herman said, those are carefully chosen words. Ipa could have just said, you look like you're dying. She said, I assume you're here to invite me to your play. Arnoa replied, I am. Countess Herman said, I'm honored that your majesty came here personally to invite me. She turns and said, but I must refuse your invitation. Arnoa said, it's not just because of your health, is it? You're looking out for your family. Countess Herman said, you're insightful as always. You saw right through me. Arnoa asked, are you afraid of angering the Grand Duke? Countess Herman said, I just don't want to leave anything that will threaten my family after I'm gone. Arnoa said, the play isn't the only reason why I'm here. Countess Herman gets confused and asked, what else is there to discuss? Arnoa said, I was genuinely worried about your health. She said, Countess Herman, would you come to the play if you weren't dying? Countess Herman gets confused and asked, what are you saying? I am afflicted with an incurable illness that no imperial physician can. Dr. Ludes interrupts her saying, it is incurable, yes. She said that illness commonly afflicts those who have heavily indulged in alcohol and tobacco from a young age. This disease is more common in Duran, where the climate is drier than the capital. Countess Herman gets shocked when she said, although it is incurable, it is treatable. You could extend your life if you want to. Countess Herman shouts, of course I want to live longer. If possible, I would like to live another month, no, even just another week. There are still too many things I haven't finished. D.R. Ludes said, the disease is called his Eric. My mother also passed away from it. But she was able to live for another ten years in a similar state as you. Countess Herman gets shocked and asks, ten years? Dr. Ludes said, if I avoid the same mistakes I made while taking care of my mother, you might be able to live even longer if you don't consume alcohol or tobacco ever again. Countess Herman shouts, I'll do anything it takes. She said, please allow me to get D.R. Ludes' treatment, your majesty. Arnoa said, that's what I came here to offer. She said, and in return, please tell me that you'll come to the play. Countess Herman smiled and said, you are indeed wise. She said, I should have sent your majesty more pictures of my nephew. With that, the long-awaited opening day of the play has finally come.